There's some tanks out there that don't need an introduction. This is one of them. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale M1A2 Abrams main battle tank. The model in this video here is built for my own personal collection and it's not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that would be best by contact me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This build here is built predominantly out of the box. However, I went ahead and made some modifications to details, and I also went ahead and replaced some other components with some aftermarket detail sets. We're gonna be going over all of this information as well as give them all a thorough inbox view in this video. And surprisingly, there's a lot going on here, not necessarily with the aftermarket stuff, but just with building the model out of the box. This one's got some surprises to it as well as lots of places to look out for. And well, we're just gonna be going over that in this video. So sit back and relax because there's gonna be a ton of stuff coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this here is the American M1A2 Abrams main battle tank. This is the standard main battle tank that has been in service with the U.S. Army now for about 30 years. The M1A2 is built upon the improved version of the M1 Abrams being the M1A1. The M1A1 entered service with the U.S. military in the late 1980s time frame, and that was the vehicle that saw service in the first Gulf War. After the vehicle's performance during that conflict, it was then further upgraded in the 1990s time frame, getting the designation M1A2. The M1A2 was a incremental change and it wasn't anything drastic like what we saw on the M1A1, where the M1A1 received the larger 120 millimeter main armament, as well as also it had a new re redesigned and revised turret that had more armor protection, as well as also a redesign to the blowout panels. The M1A2 basically kept all of this, as well as the automotive aspect from the M1A1, and then uh, added upon it with just some new technology. The biggest external change between the M1A1 and the M1A2 was with some of the turret fittings. The biggest was being the commander's cupola. The M1A1 utilized the same low profile cupola from the original M1 Abrams and that cupola actually had the ability to rotate 360 degrees and also I believe had the ability to operate the M2HB from internal inside the vehicle. These were lessons learned from the Israelis that did a similar type of setup on the Erdan cupola that was a low profile unit that was found on many of the upgraded M48s and with the US Army found on the M48A5. This was a huge improvement over the M60 with the mini turret cupola type setup that was a staple on US AFV from the 1950s throughout the 1970s time frame. The new redesigned cupola found on the M1A2 was similar in its overall shape. It was a low profile unit and it did have panoramic periscopes. However, unlike the original one where it was able to fully rotate, the A2 cupola was a fixed cupola design and was no longer able to have that feature. However, the M2HB was still able to fully rotate on this ring that was found on the external portion of the TC's cupola. The M2HB also had a redesigned cradle for specifically the M1A2 Abrams, and this unit I don't believe was able to be fired from inside of the vehicle like it was previously. However, this eventually would be revised with the Crow system, which was a remotely operated MG system that would be fastened to the turret of the Abrams. The next most notable difference between the A1 and the A2 is the CITV lens, which is an abbreviation for the Commander's Independent Thermal Viewer. This is a special optic mounted on the front portion of the turret and allows the commander to identify targets which is independent from the gunner and with this capability allows the tank to find targets and engage targets faster compared to before. As I mentioned before, that component is found on the front corner section of the turret and on the M1A1, they always anticipated that this section was going to be used for the CITV lens. However, apparently the technology just wasn't fully developed yet, but the provision for mounting the unit was built into the turret. This is why if you look at an M1A1, there's this large round section found on the front section that just plated over with a panel with some fasteners on it. 
when it came time to mount this unit in place, they already had the provisions ready to go. Just remove the plate and install the new CITV lens unit, along with the other internal electronics. But on the external portion, the piece just dr drops directly into this area here. Outside of that, there were several other internal modifications, mostly concerning electronics with the fire control unit, optics, and other things along those lines. There were also later on developed extra improved armor inserts that gave the vehicle some more improved survivability. The units entered into production in the early 1990s time frame and stayed in serial brand new production up until 1995, to which then new production was halted and then the remainder of the vehicle's production was going to be by refurbishment of taking older vehicles that were on inventory and upgrading them to M1A2 specifications. And the US Army has been doing this now continuously non-stop since the 1990s time frame. About 30 years later, all of the M1A2s in U.S. Army service have been in this type of format and have been constantly improved with new subtle changes and upgrades and add-ons in the years that followed. Specifically after the war in Iraq, we saw the addition of air conditioner units being fitted to the turret, as well as also a bunch of other gizmos and add-ons that have been trickling onto these vehicles as time progressed. And at the time of filming this video, there aren't any replacements on the horizon, so it appears that the M1A2 Abrams is going to be staying the backbone of the U.S. Armor Corps for at least a couple more decades. Before we can go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here we have the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 1990s vintage Dragon 135th scale M1A2 Abrams main battle tank kit. This is a model I've been wanting to add to my collection for a number of years for a multitude of reasons. First, I absolutely love the box art, and as we know, I'm a sucker for a nice box art. But the second reason is because I've always heard some excellent things about these Dragon M1 kits, and it'll be interesting to see exactly all of that actually pans out. The third thing is also the kit itself and the era that it came out in. It was actually pretty interesting of a release, and it's one that I definitely appreciate, and I'll definitely share that with the rest of you. This particular kit here has been sitting in my stash for about five years now or so, and, you know, it's got a little bit of dust on the surface. Not too much. I had another box on top of it. But regardless, I think it's time that I actually start on this one. Another reason why I'm actually starting on this one particularly is at the time I'm filming this video, I am working on a 116 scale Henlong M1A2 Abrams. And by the time this video drops, that model should be completed and posted on the channel. And you'll notice that I needed to tool up quite an extensive range of detail hop-ups in order to improve that model. And to act as a builder's aid, I have this kit over here to help me and assist with that. So that's part of the reason why I'm also starting it. On top of the reason it's being a cool kit and I want to build it to my collection. So back to the kit in question, Dragon released these kits and tooled them up back in the early 1990s. And this particular release here was released by them back in 1993, which is kind of amazing that it's actually at the time of filming this video, this kit basically turned 30 years old, which makes me feel archaic. Regardless, <laughs> um, the kits themselves were all 100% new tooling. And why this is relevant is that if we could rewind our clocks back to that era, if you were looking for an M1 Abrams kit, your selection was very, very limited. So, at this time, there were basically three versions of M1s that were on the market. The very first actually consisted of two kits, and they were from Eshi. Eshi released back in 1984 an M1 Abrams, a straight up as adopted M1, which I've actually did a model showcase video on that can be found on the ETA channel. The second came out of a number of years later and that was their M1A1 kit, which basically just adds upon the original tooling that was on the previous release. The other option was from Tamiya and they also had about two or three variants of M1 Abrams. They had the original M1, like the Eshi one. They did the M1A1. And then they also did another version of the M1A1 with the mine plow that's found on the front. The final variant of an M1 kit was the version from Academy, which is just 
the ten million one just jacked by Academy. But that's a cool subject of its own model showcase video that maybe someday I'll eventually get to. So with that in mind, at the same time, the Gulf War recently just ended, and the U.S. Army's M1 Abrams was the hot stuff on the scene at the time, and also at this time in the early 1990s. Not only did we have the M1A1, as well as a few variants of it, but the U.S. Army just recently adopted the M1A2. And Dragon was the first company to actually produce the M1A2 Abrams in 135th scale. As the years went on, you would have several other new additions to the market, like the unit from Italery, which is another subject of its own video. And of course, as the years continued and progressed, now we are flooded with M1 kits on the market. But the Dragon kits are still out there, and I believe they kept on producing different variants of the M1 as the years went on, basing it on the tooling from the early 1990s. So those other M1s that I just mentioned were based on tooling from the 1980s. This kit here was all 100% brand new tooling, and in addition to brand new tooling, I believe they also had some better references compared to some of the other counterparts. The Tamiya one was probably the better one of the older legacy kits on the market, and subsequently the Academy, because it just bummed off Tamiya's tooling, but the Eshi kit was definitely the weaker of the three, as there are some sections of detailing found on the Eshi kit that are much softer in comparison to the other example. And the Dragon one here was definitely light years ahead of both of those. So we'll see that once I crack open the box. As for the Dragon kits themselves, even though these kits have been on the market now for 30 years, the number that were produced were pretty good, so tracking one of these kits down is not too difficult, and you could track one of these down on eBay. I believe I paid anywhere between 25 to 30 some odd US dollars for one of these, uh, shipping not included, so they tend to be found on, you know, that type of price range, which is, you know, pretty fair for what the kits are and what they give you. These are the type of kits, because of their age, that you'll generally track down in a model show, a swap meet, and you might be able to snag one of these in your local hobby shop if they have one squirreled away, tucked away in the corner. Regardless, let's go ahead and actually start with the box art and graph design. So here we have the box art right over here, where we see a just an M1A2 Abrams zipping around a desert field, probably more like, if I was to take a guess, it would be the Desert Training Center over there in California. It doesn't really look like a rock, it has some nice mountain ranges in the background. Because this is the early or mid-1990s time frame, the vehicle is in a tricolor NATO camouflage scheme, which just, by the way, looks so classy on these M1s, specifically the M1A2s and A1s. We have two other M1s in the distance with the dust cloud getting kicked up by the turbine engine and the tracks. And overall, it's an excellent composition. Even though it's a peaceful composition, there's not any shooting or anything going on, but it's still a very nicely rendered illustration at that. The color looks absolutely excellent. I love the camouflage. I love the way it was weathered. And I'm probably going to be doing something similar on this build here. But regardless, it's a good box art. And like I always say, box art sell kits. If I was to take a guess, I'd say this is a Ronald Volstead piece, judging by the way the figures are drawn, he tends to have that type of an art style. And again, I was always a sucker for Ronald Volstead's work. For the longest time, he was probably one of the best illustrators on the market, up until you know, very recently where you have the likes of Jason, where that guy is just you know, really good. But uh, that's, you know, another another uh, story. Oh, wait, look at that. This is Volstead. Yeah, he called it. <laughs> uh, anyway, I've seen enough of his box arts. Regardless, excellent scene. I also love the way how the barrel's down on the one over here. I think that's for a reload, if I'm not mistaken. Regardless, I've seen Abrams zip around with the barrels in that position. So, outside of that, we have here the DML logo in the corner, which stands for Dragon Models Limited. Dragon always released uh, uh, kits with a few different names. They were Dragon, they also released them as DML. Then later on, they would revisit the tooling and name it Shanghai Dragon. That was, but all of them, rest assured, it's Dragon nonetheless. Here we have the the typography in a really uh, hard to read color. It's this like fuchsia pink color. And we have the M1A2 Abrams right over there. Of course, this is part of their 135th scale modern AFV series. Uh, Dragon did produce quite a number of modern kit or modern vehicle kits. They're primarily known for their 35 to 45 series, but their modern line is definitely not something to overpass. And they're kits tend to have been pretty cool at the time. They also did a range of modern Russian kits of the same period, being BMP-1s, BMP-2s, BTRs, as well as some T-72s and T-80s, to name a few. Cool kits in their own right, but someday I'll probably get to them. On the side tab over here, we have a thumbnail of the M1 Abrams, and here we have the type of graphic design for one of these 
modern kits. Which, by the way, they still continue this type of labeling, even on their current releases. If you ever built any of their M60s or their M48s, they tend to have the exact same type of graphic design. Gray background, the vehicle's name right there, 135 scale modern AFV in that uh, Caterpillar 1970 logo type font. Uh, we have here, it's kit number 3524, and then we have the DMO logo right there on the corner. Of course, it is a mirror image on the opposite side. On the section over here, we have just some corporate information. Actually, no, this is some brief history of the vehicle in question with the different languages. Barcode, and here we have the importer. And at the time, these kits were imported by Marco Polo Imports which was a company out in California. They would advertise in all the fine scale modeler catalogs or magazines, I should say. And yes, like I said before, 1993 was the date these kits were imported in the US. Eventually, the Dragon would uh, switch over to the Tamiya model where they opened up their own distributor in the United States and that would be Dragon uh, Models Online or Dragon USA, if I'm not mistaken. But back in the day, Marco Polo did the importation of their kits. On the opposite side over here, we have against their corporate info and we have uh, just some thumbnails of the built vehicle in question and the, the individual actually did a pretty decent job. It's, an, it's a handsome looking model nonetheless. Okay, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and crack the box open to reveal the kit contents. So this here being a Dragon Kit of the era does not contain any other type of more modern amenities or other amenities that Dragon would be adding to their kits around actually in the years that came after this one here. This one is an all injection molded plastic model. So no PE, no turned aluminum, no other extra fancy stuff. I believe they would eventually do that on their, ki on their Abrams kits if I'm not mistaken, but that would be in the subsequent releases that came after this one. This one here, old school injection molded polystyrene. So one thing that I instantly want to bring up is with the showmanship here. This is something that Dragon used to do back in the day on kits that they would release in the early 1990s. So we do have some cool insetting over here. And this is like the type of stuff Tamiya used to do back in the 80s as well. And they also do it on their 116s for the same reason. Just, some, you know, it makes things look cooler. So right here we have a black insert. It has the uh, 135 modern AFV series. And here we have a little pouch holding the lower hull. So starting with the lower hull, it's all made out of this light gray polystyrene color. And this is the type of plastic that Dragon would utilize on kits throughout the 1990s time frame. It wouldn't be until the early 2000s that they would switch over to that darker gray plastic. And that's the type of stuff that we see on their more contemporary kits. On the model over here, you can see that these swing arms are integrally molded on, much along the lines of what Tamiya did. And you can see the detailing found on the parts here. You know what, let me go ahead and take this part out of this bag so you get a better idea of what it looks like. So with the thing taken out, you can get to see several details. Like for instance, here we have the embossed sections found on the bottom that cover up the swing arm sections. We also have those axis caps and they are appropriately rendered on this vehicle. I actually made these in 116 and I've had to look at a lot of pictures of the real ones. And these ones here are definitely a dead ringer for those. The side sections, you can see the swing arms now in better light. And you can see the fastener details that are integrally molded on. And we also have several other details that are integrally printed on. Now, something like uh, a lot of these fittings here are a product of their era and it's hard to show their age. For instance, the swing arms on modern kits, these are separate parts that you glue on. It gives you for better detailing. This one here, they're integrally molded on as we saw in some of the older Dragon Panther three kits of the era. But they should be perfectly suffice. However, here we have a bump stop that's integrally molded on. And uh, yeah, that's something that it's, it's, it's definitely showing its age. Modern kits, this would be a separate piece that you would glue on. Come to look at it, there are, I believe, a few other... Oh, no, I guess that's what these little holes are for. They're for clips that are used to hold these side uh, skirts in place. But it appears that they are missing a few other details that would be present. But maybe it's supplied, I'm not sure. We'll see what that looks like once the build continues. The model does not have any sort of sponsons on the top, which is quite typical for many of the M1 kits, the Tamiya and Eshi both included. So it's on par with its contemporaries in that regard. Uh, one improvement that it does have is that the front toe shackles are present and they are integrally drilled out. So that's a nice feature. That's all there is to the hull. So this brings us to the turret. So we're removing this from its cocoon. The turret looks excellently detailed. The size and shape look good. I like the way they did the, they rendered out the 
the way the turret is where we have the flat plates here on the sides, but then it actually curves on this section over here and it's almost as if the M1's turret, it's actually one flat plate and they bend it to shape and uh, it's, you can see that here with the way it's rounded off. And then they weld it all to form the, the shape of the M1. The turret is asymmetrical, which would be appropriate. The model also has the anti-slip surface integrally molded on. It's a nice fine molding, so this is one of those type of things where you want to be very careful with the amount of paint that you use. You can easily overpaint over it and negates the detailing there. So that's something you do want to pay attention to. But we have here the conduits for the smoke grenade launchers. We have the mount here for the CITV lens, as well as also mounts for the cupola, loader satch, and those little standoffs that the M240 MG mount is located on. Of course, we have the million dollar blowout panels, which would be right here. They appear to be separately molded items, which yields for some better detailing. The other side here, we have that nice little notch, which honestly, I'm not really sure what that's for. If anyone is an M1 guy, tell me. If there's like a grill or something back there, I'm not really certain. I do know that on more modern versions of the M1, this, there would be an air conditioner duct that runs under the turret section over here, but uh, that's, that wouldn't be present on this older example. Here goes the 120. It is a two-piece assembly. Again, quite customarily seen on these plastic tank kits, both past, present, and most certainly future. Here we have the mantlet. It is a multi-part assembly. It appears that the mantlet is non-functional. Oh, no, it is. Looks like the mantlet can go up and down, which is a nice feature. Be interesting to see how that looks once everything is fully built. And we have here the coax, which is not in, uh, drilled out on the end, and a product of its era, but that's something that's easily taken care of with a pin vise. That's all there is to the turret. Okay, we'll touch upon that in a moment. Let's go ahead and look at the next runner here, which contains several more detail components. Well, these bags have definitely been hermetically sealed since the 1990s, and this room right now is filling up with old plastic model kit aroma, and that is an aroma that is second to none. Yes, I absolutely love it. Okay, so uh, looking at this runner here takes us to the upper hull. It's on this nice ornate sprue. And the upper hull is very, very nicely detailed. We have more of that non-slip surface that has been rendered onto all of the appropriate areas. And it's done correctly where there's actually a format to how the non-slip is found. And some areas have it, some areas don't. All those are present here on the Dragon 2 link. This was something that was definitely a leg up over the competition. I'm not sure if the Tamiya one did that. I know the old kit didn't. I'm not sure about the A1 and the Mindplow release, but regardless, the Dragon one here has that detailing tag really molded on. The other details appear to be excellent. We have here the right geometry here for the tin work. It has the rubber mud flap detailing present as well. We have here the meshwork found on the rear grills. They're very finely molded, so again, care is gonna have to be exhibited by the builder for the layers of paint found on these surfaces. But if you play your cards right, they should turn out very nicely. And these will look even better once they get that panel line accent added. Unlike the other examples, the engine grills are a separate molding. And uh, that, it, that's not really interior detail, it's just more rigidity straps. But Regardless, that's a nice little feature, and I believe that Dragon actually sold as an aftermarket a rest in detail engine insert under their sister company that went by the name of Crin, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Crin was their, their sister company that sold basically hop-ups for their kits, and that's why it, this part would have been a separate molding. But again, it, again, it leads for nice accuracy and nice detailing regardless. We have the little grab handles on the bins. And yeah, you know, everything looks good. So again, these kits are, they, they seem by, so far they seem to be a very nice model. Specifically again for the era. So the next runner here contains, well, some more pieces. Here we have the rear engine grill or engine uh, plate, I should say. Excellent detail again with the non-slip and the other accoutrements. We have here the rear grill work, which is, you know, quite up to standard with the other contemporaries of the time. For instance, the example from Tamiya. This was uh, this was far more superior compared to the one on the Eshi, which the Eshi is there, but it's not nearly as well defined as it is on the Tamiya and the Dragon. The Dragon one does have the outer heat shield grill fitted in place. And if you see my 116 video on the M1, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. 
The grill work, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, <laughs> my mistake, the tin work is also very nicely rendered out where we have the hinges in the correct locations as well as the securing straps. We have some fastener details right here on the rear portion of the sprocket tin work. Very finely molded, nice quality. Nothing really present on the interior sections. So this is one of those models where you're basically going to secure the pieces in place. Although it looks like we do have some hinging uh, or some option to have the piece hinged open, which is an interesting feature, but I'm not really sure if that's really what the kids designed for because we are missing, I believe, some of the internal struts, or at least I can tell from here. We have that auxiliary box that's found on the back, which is a kind of bit of detail we found on the A1. I believe the A2 might have had it as well. Not sure. Hatch looks good. Some decent detailing on it. From what I've seen on the more recent uh, versions of the M1A2, the hatch seems to be a little bit more uh, improved where there's some extra lip detailing and other things along those lines, but I'm pretty sure this one here is depicting again an Abrams from this era. And those other features probably came later on. No, that's just, that's just a rough hunch. Anyone's an Abrams guy, be sure to let me know in the comments section. The next runner here is the Cupola, and of course being an A2, the Cupola is very different compared to the A1. It's one of the changes that was made. And the you know Cupola itself doesn't look too bad. Decently rendered, again, for the era that we are talking about here. Nice multi-part assembly. The periscopes are integrally molded on. On more contemporary kits, these tend to be made out of clear plastic, but for the era up on par with what you got. The MG mount is very nicely detailed. There's a lot of separate little parts here that need to be assembled in sub-assemblies, which again, yields for good detailing. The CITV lens looks good too. The lens is again, molded solid as opaque plastic, but with a few coats of gloss paint should polish up very nicely. The hatch appears to be functional. Not really sure if that's the case or not, but we'll see as the build goes on. We also have here a set of water slide decals. At the time, Dragon would actually have their decals printed in Japan, and I don't know who the firm was that made their decals, but I will say that their decal quality for their older kits were actually very good. And from what I've seen on other old vintage Dragon kits that I've built over the years, the decals hold up very, very well and varnish on even better. So I'm not predicting any problems with these decals over here. Regardless, you know, again, we'll see again as the build continues exactly how well they hold up. The next runner consists of more detail components. Apparently these are for the turret. On this runner here, we have several A1 components, such as the original A1 or just Abrams style of cupola. Obviously that's gonna be a spare part, it's not gonna be used. Here we have the loader's hatch though. The loader's hatch has some really nice internal detailing integrally molded on. We have here the gypsy rack detailing. The gypsy rack is a multi-part assembly, which again is how basically all the other contemporaries did it at the time. What is not included is any sort of photo etch, which generally these gypsy racks would have a mesh on the bottom portion, as what is seen again on other vehicles like the M60. But you know, that's something that I guess I'm gonna have to fabricate on my own. Not too hard to do, I've done things like that in the past. Here go the million dollar blowout panels right over there. You can see they have the round, negated texture areas found around those lift rings or those uh, fasteners, I believe. There we go, in the light. <laughs> it should look really good once everything is painted. Here we have the rear plate here on the turret has the appropriate detailing, fasteners and strap details. We got some ammo can details. The supports that hold up the gypsy rack look excellent. Side bins look good. The gunner's periscope box looks excellent. And the model does have tow cables integrally molded on. These are plastic tow cables, much along the lines that you would see on the other kits. Although I believe the Tamiya kit may have gave you string for that. But I may be mistaken. I haven't built a Tamiya one yet. Or last time I did, I was like seven or eight years old. So it's been a while. It's been a while since I've done a proper Tamiya on one Abrams. Which should, nah, that's subject to change. But regardless, yeah, looks like a pretty straightforward injection molded plastic build. Ooh, this piece is falling off. I gotta make note of that. Be careful I don't lose that baby. 
That's the type of thing that loves to go to Lost Partia. So, that's what we have for the remainder of the parts. And this brings us to the last of the parts over here that contain the running gear. And you'll notice that, these, that this bag is already open. That's because I actually have to crack into this one prematurely because I needed to make a mold of something in order to build another M1. As I referenced before, I did a review a little while ago on the Eshi 135th scale M1, and in that video, I mentioned that the rear tail light that was found on the Eshi kit suffered some damage, and I needed to replace it. Well, the one I replaced it with was a dragon one. I took one of the dragon ones off of the sprue, I made a mold of it, and that's the one that's used on the Eshi example. After the molds were made, the parts were quickly thrown back into the bag over here, sealed up, so I don't lose them. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and reopen this parts of or this bag of parts. Okay. So I'm not even gonna talk about that for the moment. Let's go and look at the runner at hand. So this runner here contains the running gear. So we have the row wheels and the sprocket. One thing I want to point out that on the M1, the row wheel hubcaps are clear plastic, and on this one here, they're molded in opaque, which is quite standard and was done on all the other contemporaries, both from Eshi and Tamiya. I'll be talking about this later on as the video goes on, but needless to say, when you do an M1, there's something that you want to do on the hubcaps just to make the tank a little bit more polished. Over here, you can see the detailing for the sprockets. Sprockets look good, but they are missing the mud slits. This, again, was another a mission that was done on many other Abrams kits of the era and also basically up until recently. So it's in Wicked Company in that regard, I guess. We have here some more parts for the Gypsy Rack. They look pretty frail, so that's going to be fun deburring. We have here the, the two return rollers, which is something that was absent on the Tamiya. I don't believe the Tamiya gave you those detailed parts, but I may be mistaken, but I'm quite confident those were admitted on the Tamiya. Here we have the tail lights as well as the headlight detailing. They were separate moldings unlike the other contemporaries and that does again leave for better detailing. Here we can see the, the brush guard for the tail light which on the Abrams is this distinctive tube like structure. And it has the cutout in the appropriate location. The running gear runner is just uh, given to you as a duplicate, again, much along the lines of many other tank kits. And here you can see the two parts I needed to use as the mold or the master for the one that I referenced before. Here's the tube structure. It's got that cruciform section in the middle that we saw before and the tail light is in that bag. And yes, I am definitely going to make note of that. Put this in a Ziploc bag so I don't lose it before I actually dig into this one. Because again, I'm you know using this one to help me with the 116. At the very bottom of the box takes to the instructions. And this is quite standard on the type of instructions that we would see on kits of this era. The instructions look to be very clear and concise. They appear to be hand-drafted drawings. I do not believe these are CAD. Basically, what you see is what you get. As I generally mention in these videos, if there's any sort of misprint or a mistake with the instructions, I'll definitely be sure to point that out. So after watching this video up to this point, the model looks great. The subject matter is cool. The execution looks to be pretty solid. And the model seems to be able to be built into a nice, decent representation of the M1A2. And this brings us to the knee buster of the entire kit. And it's also the reason why I never got one or added one in my collection up until very recently. And if you watch my videos and enjoy my content, you'll probably know why. Of course, this being a Dragon Kit and a Dragon Kit of the 1990s, for the tracks, Dragon went with their typical MO. Static, individual, link and length. As we know, I'd rather have a colonoscopy than even attempt to utilize these tracks. But since I'm here, I might as well mention that these tracks are actually interesting in their own right because these tracks here are the Bigfoot pattern of tracks. 
Why that's relevant is that because both of the other contemporaries at the time, the one from Tamiya and Eshi, both had the early chevron pattern of tracks, which by this time period were gone, or mostly gone unless you saw you know, older M1s that were still in inventory and mostly just used in National Guard units. But by and large, the mainstay tanks being used by the US Army had the flat pad track. And those are the ones that we have here. Also, this kit is in good company with the mistake of utilizing these tracks because Eshi doomed their M1 by going with the exact same format. Fortunately, at the time, you were not completely lost because AFV Club was a new founded company at this time, and they had the big brain idea on producing workable track links for the M1 family in both patterns. So there are workable track links on the market that were able to solve this problem. But regardless, here go the tracks over here. No, I'm not going to review them. They're getting tossed just like the other ones do. And in their place, I'm going to be utilizing a more suitable set of tracks for this particular build, which are the ones that we have right here from Ryfield Models. These tracks here are a recent addition to the 135th scale marketplace, and if you are building a 135th scale M1 Abrams, you do have quite a few options to pick from from tracks, be it the early pattern Chevron ones or the later pattern Bigfoot type tracks that we see here from a multitude of different manufacturers and mediums. As for these particular tracks, well, these are going to be the subject matter of their very own 135th scale track link tutorial and review video that will be posted on the ECA channel shortly after this video here makes its debut. So if you're interested to know exactly how these tracks stack up and how I build them and install them, that's something that is going to be posted a day or two after this video drops. So stay tuned for that. Jumping ahead a little bit, here we have the model going through its initial early assembly phase. And there are some things that stood out to me and I just want to mention them at this time. Overall, the model is going together pretty well, but there's some areas that you can tell that this model here was designed in a certain era. The model goes together, but some assisting and jigging is going to be required or to get everything to line up in its appropriate location and properly. Unlike some of the other older kits I've done where it may require some hand fitting here or there, so far I haven't really encountered any of that per se, but the piece as you can see needs quite a bit of assistance in order to get the the sections lined up while the glue is properly set. And if they don't, well it can open up a Lithmia problem. Starting with the upper hull segment here, as I Shown before, the model is connected on its sprue on several connection points. These snip away simple enough, then you just go ahead and deburr accordingly. However, the one thing that you do want to pay attention to is the one nub that we have right here on the side. With the way the piece is molded, there is a tree that connects to this section over here, and when you're deburring, you may feel the need that this is something that is not supposed to be present, and you're going to want to snip it away and blend it away flush. And this is a mistake. You need this little tab over here because this is an index point for the side skirts that are going to be mounted as the build goes on. I'm just mentioning at this time because there are several found on the side of the model here and if you're not cautious or if you're just going through the build on autopilot so to speak, you can easily delete these sections here and it's going to cause a bit of a problem later on down the road. So I'm just mentioning that at this time here so you're aware of this potential issue that can potentially emerge. The other thing I want to mention involves the engine deck here. Like we saw before, this entire section here is a removable, or I should say it's a separately molded panel, which is great. It has some advantages to that. However, when you're getting ready to secure to the upper hull, or I should say to the lower hull here, you need to have this section fitted in place or else the fit's not going to line up that well. And it's going to require a little bit of extra work in addressing. The piece drops into this location here pretty well. There is some slight flash I found on this section here. Nothing major, just a little overhang, a slight thin overhang and a little swipe of a X-Acto knife was really all that's required to get the pieces where they need to be fit wise. The other thing I want to mention is actually with the shape of the upper. On this one here, I had to slightly bend and contour, or I should say recontour the upper because it was slightly warped. This is more likely due to being shoved in the box for 20 something years. And because of that, it developed a, a slight little warp. The warp was definitely not something to worry about, but it would have caused issue when it came time for mounting this section in place. As you can see, this piece needs to be absolutely straight as humanly possible. So it it appropriately lines up with the rear engine deck. 
when I was lining the piece up, I saw that it was having a little difficulty with the alignment, so I was able to gently, I cannot stress this enough, gently press and just gently form the rear section over here so that the piece was able to s slip in in the appropriate manner. This is again something you want to pay attention to on one of these builds if you encounter it. In order to to adjust, I did not use any heat, absolutely no heat, no water, nothing like that. I just basically just put use my thumbs over here and I more or less coerce or massaged the unit to a way where it was nice and straight. Again, it's a fairly risky procedure. It's best done for somebody that has a lot of experience with models. If you built a number of builds already, you should be able to know what I'm talking about. Just a little force here, there, and you know, you do a little bend, a little torque, you check it on the light. Okay, is it straight? No. A little more? Okay, get in there. And then once you hit that certain sweet spot, you could then glue this piece in place. It'll fit right in really, really well. And once it's dropped in place, let the glue set like I did here. And then you're good to go for the next installation. Bring us to the lower hull. As you can see, it's still in this format over here from when I installed the rear plate. The rear plate is just a single piece that just drops onto this location. But the one thing I want to mention is that you, you can see that I have to use a rubber band here in order to get some torque, in order to get this piece locked up so that the glues can fully set. With the way the piece is designed, it does fit on pretty well, but there really isn't any positive engagement that keeps the part snug in place. And because of that, it may want to move or adjust on you while the glues are setting, which again is something you want to avoid. Best way to do this is I lined everything up and then I added this rubber band over here, tied it around the two torsion bars and this gives lots of tension and it sucks the piece into place as you can see here. Because of this little mod or I should say this technique, I was able to get the rear hull fitted in place. Little rubber band is going to be <laughs> scraped away later, but it, it, this is something I'd rather do as opposed to dealing with a gap in this section over here because if you have a gap in this area over here and if this is not aligned properly it's gonna have a domino effect and it's gonna screw up the upper hull alignment as well so again something to watch out for other than that it goes together pretty well also at this time you can see I drilled out the two sections over here these are toe points and they are molded blades so I simply just hit it with a pin vise drilling out the holes in the center just for extra detailing the next thing I want to mention is the turret. As you can see, the turret is fully, well, I should say partially assembled at this point. The main assemblies are out of the way. And needless to say, yeah, you need a lot of alignment <laughs> on this thing to make sure it lines up appropriately. The way the piece is designed, the sections do have a tongue and groove type system. However, there's a bit of play in this section over here, which again is indicative for a model tooled up in this era and the piece will fit very well but again you're going to need to thoroughly rubber band the hell out of it to make sure it it all lines up appropriately specifically once the glues are setting the turret is a multi-piece assembly it's actually three pieces for the main shape as well as a fourth piece which is the trunnion over here for the 120 which i'll mention momentarily the one thing to watch out for is this rear plate this is a nice design where it just drops into this area over here. And as you can see, the rubber bands were used just to make sure it's all sucked in and everything lines up accordingly. If you go ahead and take your time with this, it should go together very well. There was no hand fitting required. It's not like I had to fudge some and remove some material off of one section as opposed to the other. It, it dropped right on. It's just that there's no positive engagement like what we see on more modern tooling kits. So again, something else to consider. I think at this point here I could remove the rubber bands. This thing has been sitting overnight, so it's one of those type of procedures you do and then you just walk away. You do the old road warrior technique. Just walk away. Ooh, he's pretty good. The final two things to mention at this time is the mantlet. This is a multi-part assembly. In fact, there's one more part that I haven't glued on yet because this needs to be done just prior to installation. And I'll go over that later on as the video continues. But the mantlet is very nicely detailed. With the way it is a multi-piece assembly, you do have to take your time and make sure that the parts all line up appropriately and you have no shifting or yawing going on, which is something that can easily happen with this because again, there is very little to no positive engagement on the parts. It's more or less you have to just make sure 
and jig everything appropriately. Fortunately, with the way this piece is designed, it's self-supporting, so the hardest part is getting the two side sections in place, and everything will then line up appropriately when the top plate is then dropped in. So you have to make sure everything is lined up accordingly, and just basically just eyeball it, making sure everything is lined up where it needs to be. Again, something that's not really hard to do, but it's another piece where you want to stay on the ball if you're working on one of these builds. A similar type feature is found on this box that we have here, which is going to be mounted on the back of the hull as the build continues. The piece is very nicely detailed. However, again, it's all just glued together panels, which can lead to some yawing and skewing. Fortunately, the top and bottom plates kind of lock and jig it into its appropriate shape, which is fantastic. But one thing that I want to mention is that the instructions are very, very vague when it comes for the assembly of this piece. So much so that, let me go ahead and grab the instructions so you see what I'm talking about. With the instructions in hand, right here you can see the assembly for that cube. And as you can see, it is fairly vague with the orientation of everything. You have to basically pay attention to the subtle details on the drawing. Like for instance, on this back plate over here, we have those two half round sections. That would be this plate and you're actually holding it upside down. The other thing to mention is you can easily screw up and install these panels on in reverse or upside down. So again, you want to pay attention to the orientation. This plate over here has that little key shaped object, which is right there. So you want to orient it appropriately. The side uh, plate over here has the triangle handle right there. So again, you want to pay attention to this. The other two things are the top and bottom. This is something that I actually screwed up during my build where I realized it really early on, I'm like, you know, oh crap. And I was able to pop the units off and mount them on appropriately or else it was going to be a problem. This was done definitely before the glue started to take hold. Luckily, I am using Slow Cure CA for my assembly, and that's what I use on all my models for good reasons. The one last thing to mention about the cube is the top plate that we have here. Note the detailing integrally molded on. Hopefully it comes out in focus. So you can see the two little axis hatches right there on the top. And if you look at the instructions, yeah, you're not gonna see any of that. And this is the plate here that's on the bottom. And there is no other drawing of this section in the instructions in this format. As for the correct orientation, luckily on the back end of the instructions, you can see the color chart. And on the color chart, it's rendered with the box in place. And there you can see what it looks like with the hatches in the appropriate location. So this is, again, another one of those things you want to watch out for when you're doing one of these builds. As you can mount this part on in a multitude of different ways, all of which are incorrect and will just obliterate the look of the component. So, again, something that you need to pay attention to if you're working on one of these builds. And you're definitely building it with the power box that we have there in the back. One last thing to mention at this time because, well, why not? Here you can see the 120 going through its assembly process. As we mentioned before, it's a two-piece assembly. And this is what it looks like when I'm assembling one of these type of units. I basically remove the major sections off of the sprue, deburr them, and then I glue them in place. During the setting, I like to use a multitude of these little handy spring clips that I have here. These I picked up from Tractor Supply a couple years ago and have been absolutely crucial and instrumental on all of my builds. Can't recommend them enough and you can probably find these on AliExpress, eBay, Amazon, Harbor Freight, you name it. I, if you're a modeler, I cannot recommend these things enough. They're awesome. If though you're working on a budget and you do not have the five or ten bucks to buy these things, well you can always use Clothespins, that's right, clothespins, the wooden ones that are used outdoors will definitely do this job in the same manner. So that's another option you have, and another quick tip you have for me to assemble one of these pieces. For something like this, you want to really jig it well because a lot of times it could shift and skew on you while the glues are setting, and this will definitely lead to some negative results. So jig it well, and you could be able to then progress accordingly. From here, I'm going to add another thick bead of silly, or CA <laughs> on, on the seams over here, and then I could progress with the seam removal process, which will include a needle file and some sandpaper, and then, you know, once it's all polished down, you'll see what it looks like in its final form. But more on that to come.
Before I actually secure the upper to the lower hull, one feature I'm going to add on this model is a working driver's hatch. This is a why not feature and it's what I typically mention in these videos. On many kits out there, the hatch is separately molded and on many examples, it's like this one over here where there's a little pin that emerges from the bottom portion of the hatch. Generally the way this works is you either mount it in the closed or the open position to suit the builder's needs. However, if the pin is long enough, in most cases you can actually have the best of both worlds and have the hatch actually function. And that's what we're gonna do on this example here. The only prep work that I did was I carefully painted the inner hatch well with a paintbrush with some Tamiya Nato Green. This is gonna be the same color I'm gonna use for the base coat as the build progresses. But on the inside here, I painted at this time because after the hatch is fitted in place, it's a bit tricky to get in here and you don't want to fuse and weld things together with more layers of paint. The other thing I did was I spray painted some olive drab spray paint, some just Krylon OD that I have on hand. I just shot the inside portion here of the hatch just so it has something on it and this does act as a bit of a primer coat. Even though admittedly this is not going to be repainted as the build goes on, but again at least I have something on here as opposed to just bare plastic. So in order to do the procedure, I'm actually going to use a soldering gun. This here is my old soldering gun. I've been using this for many, many years. And this is actually what I use for melting the pins on the single piece final track. So I like the old Tamiya tanks out there. The I use a little drop of super glue. I secure the two sections together. Then you have those little prongs that come out. You need to melt those little sections in order to just fuse everything together and it makes for a stronger bond. And that's where I use this fella right over here. Works really good. It's nice and precise. And I just use it just for this application. I do not do any sort of soldering with this. This is purely used just as a method for melting certain plastic or rubber tabs and you know it's come into handy on a large number of builds for the last 30 plus years i've been doing this to do the procedure it's really easily done you basically just put the hatch in place and then you melt a small amount of material on the end of that tab over there and once it solidifies it's mushroomed and it's not going to be able to pop out allowing the piece to rotate However, one trick I want to recommend is when you're doing that, you want to make sure you have the hatch positioned in the open state. The reason why I say this is because in the open state, it's going to use more of that stem. And if you go ahead and melt the tab when the hatch is in its closed state, you're going to have more plastic to melt. And when you do that, that's going to be fine dandy, but you may have difficulty in opening the hatch because the length that was needed to actually physically open has now been mushroomed. So this is something you want to be aware of when you're doing this procedure. That's why a simple trick is to simply leave it in the open state. With it in the open state, you get to see just how much material is left on the inside. Obviously, this is something that is not going to be able to work on every kit out there. A lot of kits that have a feature like this, the tab is far too short. And if that's the case, you're just going to roll with it in a static format. But with this one over here, you can see the stem that is emerging. And I have this guy plugged in. I'm going to go ahead, heat him up. And I'm just going to melt a very finite amount of material here. And that's basically it. So hopefully that was able to come out on camera. And if I position the hatch, it is now fully functional. It's not going to fall out and the piece still has its functional capability. From here, I'm ready to finally mount this guy onto the tank and continue with the build. Also, with the upper and lower hulls together, it's now time to address the next thing, which are the sponsons, or I should say the lack thereof them. This kit is just like many other kits that are out there from a smattering of different companies where the sponsons are absent for one reason or another. Also, one other thing to mention is that of all the M1s that I've seen so far, and I've built examples from Tamiya, Trumpeter, obviously this one here is from Dragon, even the old Eshi kit from the 80s, they all seem to just leave out the sponsons. Now, I can't speak for some of the more modern kits that have been on the market from Ryefield or Panda or anything like that. At some point in time, I picked those up or even Italeri. However, for most of the kits that I've seen, they are sponsonless. 
By and large, you can build a tank without the sponsons, and once you throw the side skirts on, you can call it a day. It's not really a problem. However, it's one of those things that always bugs me, and I always like to fabricate them because it just, well, it makes me feel better. But the other thing is, it actually does give the model more rigidity and more... It just makes it feel more solid compared to the way it is right now. If you could hear it, it just... It just seems flimsy without the sponsors in place, and this is true for most of the other kits out there on the market, regardless of the vehicle type, that has a similar feature. To remedy this, I'm going to go ahead and fabricate the sponsons. In order to do that, I'm going to utilize a similar method that I've touched upon on many of my videos that had a feature similar to this. So off camera, I went ahead and made a template. This here is just some printer paper. I basically just lined it up on this section over here. And then with a pencil, I scribed the line here on the outside as well as also on this end over here. With the template in hand, I was able to cut it out and I was able to transfer it to two sections of sheet styrene. The styrene itself was well, one, I should say that on a vehicle like this, the sponsons are fairly easy because they're just rectangles, as you can see. However, the front things get a little tricky because of the geometry that we have here on the Abrams. It's very, very small, and it basically comes to a needle point right here on this section. On the plastic section, I went ahead and filed down a angle. Hopefully that comes out on camera. And this was done to both of the units that we have here. And this was just so it clears and fits in a little bit better. The other thing to mention is that on the Dragon Kit specifically, there are these two little, like, rectangles that are integrally molded into the upper hull. Basically, it looked like this section over here, but found in these two areas. These are obviously in the way and are obtrusive, so they had to go. I polished these down with a Dremel with a high-speed removal bit, a couple swipes, and the units, or I should say the sections were deleted, leaving for the flatter appearance that we have here. From this point onward, I could go ahead and get the sponson and fit it in place. This is something that's going to be a little tricky because generally on these builds, I tend to use some angle strip as a support. However, on the M1 over here, it's a little tricky because trying to get into these areas over here aren't really that easy, but fortunately, it's something I should be able to just finagle my way with getting. I'm not going to go ahead and get that on camera. We'll just cut across one that's already been completed. After a few minutes see what the tank looks like with the sponsons added in place. These went on pretty easily. Also, a revision of what I said before about the angle. Yeah, don't listen to what I said before. You need the angles. Uh, it was a really simple thing to add. I just cut some quarter inch plastruct angle right over here to two little segments and boom, glued them on those two sections over here and it worked the charm absolutely perfectly. Gave it some nice support and also allowed the super glue to just flow in and solidify everything in place. For the adhesives, I used both my standard thick super glue and I also used the thin stuff right over here. It just went right in. It just, it's amazing how great that watery stuff is. It goes right into the seams and it bonds almost on contact. So it is a fantastic method to fabricate your sponsons, or I should say to adhere your sponsons. The sponsor work is now done, and as you can hopefully hear, the model sounds much more rigid, much more solid, and it just has a more solid feel to it as well. Again, it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things when the side skirts get fit in place, but ah, just one of those things that just makes for a better, more thorough build, as opposed to leaving them off. Obviously, this is stepping outside the kit confines, and it will require a bit of skill and fabrication knowledge to go ahead and fabricate these. And if you do not have those, say you're an intermediate or some type of a builder like that, just roll stock and just call it a day. But if you do have those extra skill sets and the materials on hand, yeah, it's always better to add it than to leave it off. Progressing further with the build takes us to the smoke grenade launchers. This kit here has the earlier pattern of smoke grenade launchers, which were always really cool, or at least I always found. However, the part is a multi-piece assembly, which actually leaves it for a very detailed piece. However, one thing to mention is that the instructions are... If I say they're vague, that's actually a massive understatement. It really took me about three or four attempts just to get the things assemble to the point that we have here. So I'm going to go ahead and actually bring up the instructions so you see exactly what I'm talking about. 
if you are looking at the instructions and are looking at the part, just trying to find the orientation and how the pieces line up is actually going to be pretty problematic. So much so I actually had the pieces on upside down during the test fitting process. So this is something that you really need to test fit in before, prior to actual assembly. I also believe the numbers may be reversed on the instructions. Hard to say, I kind of it's kind of a wash since I was playing around with this piece in, multi, in a multitude of different configurations. It probably is correct, and it was probably just me not getting the instructions in the drawing, but regardless, here you can see the parts now assembled, or partially assembled. So we have the front face of the grenade launcher, as well as the back portion. And these two need to be glued together, and then from here they need to correspond with the actual bracket. If you look at the part, you will see the mounting nubs on the top as well as the third one right there on the bottom and you need to find the corresponding one that it connects to and this actually does line up pretty good fortunately even though the instructions are a bit vague and there we go this one here is for this unit it's a bit tricky to get on camera specifically without the glues being added at this time but once the piece gets glued on you'll see what it looks like in its final form the component is a multi-part assembly, like I mentioned before, so that means you will have a seam to contend with right there on this center portion. This is something that needs to be addressed because this can and will hurt the look of the build. These pieces are all, I believe, forged aluminum and then they're milled out, and because of that, there is no seam and they are solid through and through. So this is something that needs to be contended with. I use some thick super glue, a needle file, and some sandpaper, and I basically polish it down much along the lines as I do on the barrels. On the front face over here, I went ahead and with a pin vise, I drilled out these holes, making them deeper, more recessed, and this always has the added benefit of giving the model extra accuracy and just more realism, as opposed to the way they are stock, where they tend to be shallow molded. And this is something that is commonly seen on many other kits on the market of this pattern. And it's also something that always I recommend to improve the look on the model, be it on this, an M88, an M60, regardless if it has a system, it always helps to drill these sections out with a pen vise. Also continuing with the build, we have here the tube for the coax MG. On the M1 Abrams, there's a really cool feature where the coax is shrouded and that detailing is supplied with the kit. However, it is molded solid. In order to improve the kit, I'm going to go ahead and drill it out. Now, I could do this in a multitude of ways. You could do it with a pin vise or with a Dremel. However, I'm going to utilize the lathe because the lathe is the best way to ensure that the hole is concentric and straight in the center without it being canted. Obviously, this is not the type of thing that most people can do if you do not have the equipment. And if this is you, just ro rock on with the other methods that I mentioned before, be it either with a pin vise or with the Dremel. But again, this is one of those procedures where you want to have a steady hand because if you're off, you can potentially ruin the part. Fortunately, if you do, you can actually just replace it outright with a tube, either a thin piece of aluminum or brass, either way, or even a plastic tube, Either way, that will actually be arguably better than rolling with the kit one, but for this build over here, I'm going to just recycle it by drilling it out with the lathe. No point getting on camera, let's cut across and continue with the video. As the build continues along, I have just encountered the hardest, most difficult aspect on this particular build. Every build out there, no matter how simple or complex, has an area where it's a bit challenging or an area where you really got to pay your attention to and for this one here it's no exception and I have just encountered it. What is this area that I'm referring to? Well quite simply put it's the gypsy rack. The gypsy rack on this model here is nicely detailed in that everything or just about everything is a separate molded component so you have to do assembly in sub-assembly formats. That is usually indicative of something that has high detailing on it. However, one, it makes it more complex, but the second thing is, is when we're dealing with a thing like a gypsy rag, gypsy rags by their nature are always extremely frail, and this one here is no exception, but it's also compounded because of its complexity. If we look here on the side portion, you get to see one of the gypsy racks partially assembled. So we have, which by the way is a very iconic bit of detailing on the M1 Abrams, this rack here found on the side of the turret that has a storage box. The rack itself, is comprised of a bunch of components. The first is the main box itself where it has the rails integrally molded in. That's simple enough. And then you have the rails, and the rails themselves are each separately molded parts. This is where things get complex. The rails themselves 
need to be removed off of the sprue, which by their nature are quite frail. And on top of that, they need to be cleaned. You have burrs and even some other little sacrificial bits of plastic that need to be deleted. And then you could clean up the part and install it in place. This is where things get tricky because in order to remove those little sacrificial sections off, you are going to have a little burr remaining. Then you're going to remove the piece off of the sprue and you have some more burrs remaining. And with the nature of this piece here, trying to sand that down with some sandpaper or a needle file, it becomes very fragile and you can and probably will break a rail or two. And I did break a couple of them on this build. So the way to avoid that is to first sac or cut off the little sacrificial nubs with the clean cut snips. With some sandpaper, while the piece is still on the sprue, you polish down the areas that you just eliminated. By doing this, this will prevent or should prevent some damage to occur onto the rails because you have the rail being self-supported by the sprue. Once that's taken care of, you can then fully remove the rail altogether. Once the rail is removed, you're going to be tempted to try to polish it down with some sandpaper, and that is something you want to avoid because, again, of how frail it is. The best way to polish the rails down is after the things are fitted in place because now they are self-supported by the tank, and they are much stronger and more rigid compared to the way you have them before when they're running around loose. So you glue them in place once the glue sets. You then carefully go over these sections here with some fine sandpaper, and that will have the effect of smoothing out the little burr points and making everything nice and smooth. And that's true for many grab handle type fittings or, that are out there. However, for this build, this is where things also get a little bit more complicated. Because of the little rails that we have here, I found that the molded in sections where the rails connect to are too small and the rail is actually molded in a slightly thicker plastic compared to the, the sections or suggestion points found on the rails here. If you try to install this and brute force it, you're just going to break everything and it's not going to work. What you're going to have to do is you can actually have to enlarge and widen these little slots that are molded into the, sto uh, the storage bin. This is best done either with some sandpaper or you take some sandpaper and you bend it into this type of shape here and you run up and down the sections or do what I did and use a, a needle file preferably a thin flat needle file this again takes some hand fitting and some finesse because you can easily over sand and damage the rails or I should say the rail holders once the rail holders are done, you then go through the process of gluing the rails in place. And this goes by fairly easy, although the rails may want to torque on you and bend on you just with the nature of these things. On the side of the turret over here, there are suggestion points. And these are more or less a suggestion point. They may not necessarily line up with the hull when you're gluing them in place. So the best thing to do is to make sure that they are as straight as possible. And if there is or I should say if they're off from the suggestion point, don't worry about it. Just let the glue set and then you can just work around with some sandpaper, blending in the suggestion point, making it nice and smooth. That is definitely seen more here on the opposite side where I haven't quite polished it down yet and you can see where the suggestion points are and how the rails line up. Not exactly a bullseye. However, in a few moments, I'm gonna go ahead and tackle this with some precision sanding and that should alleviate what we have here and I'll make it look more representable to the way we have it on this side. The other thing I do want to mention on this kit here, the bins do fit on, but for some reason this bin doesn't sit flush with the side of the armor, or I should say the mount for the rail doesn't sit flush with the armor. In order to make up the gap here, I went ahead and glued a small little strip of styrene strip, fit perfectly in this spot over here. Once it dried, I just polished with some sandpaper before the assembly of everything else. This side here didn't really need that, so it just went on more or less out of box. And this leads us to the next aspect, which is the, the last mount that we have here. There's one supposed to be on each side. You have a suggestion point right over here, and the parts are supplied with the kit. However, trying to fit them on, you're definitely going to require some hand fitting on this one. So the rails themselves are slightly too long. Even if you try to follow the piece, it's just not going to fit in place. You are going to have to snip off a little section, and this is something that's going to have to be done by hand, individually. It's not like you could just measure and cut on each side. You have to literally hand fit the piece and adjust accordingly. The other thing I want to mention is that the kit supplied ones are slightly too short. On this one here you can see how I made up the difference here with gluing on a piece of styrene strip to the bottom portion of the bracket. This ate up the difference and it, I was able to catch up with the rails. The rails must be straight. You cannot bend them inward. So it's easier just to 
add the bit of material over here than to try to go the other way around. On this one here, you can see I also went ahead and added the little strip. This one's about to be cleaned off. I'll just have to wait for the super glue to dry. Once this is all refined, I can then go through the process of, of trying to fit the piece in place and then marking and cutting off the extra length of rods. This is one of those things where you most definitely want to measure twice and cut once because if you cut these pieces too short, you're, you're basically screwed. You're not gonna be able to really fix that all that easily. So again, measure twice, actually more like measure three times and cut once, just to make sure you're doing it right the first time around. On this one here, because I had to add that extender, and again, this is just the way the kit is, I actually had to add an actual little piece of plastic to this guy over here. This one here, I just had to add the one without a even thinner strip like you can see here, add it to the bottom again, just to make up the difference. So with that in mind, I could continue with the build. This again is probably going to be pr the most difficult aspect of the entire build and that gets me to the remaining section of the gypsy rack, the one that overhangs on the back here. This thing, whoo, 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 boy. All right, so if these pieces were frail, this piece is on the same level. It's not as frail because it is a self-supporting box, but you do have to pay attention. There are sacrificial nubs of plastic that bridge the gaps between the rails, so you have to cut those off polish them down, and then on top of that, there's another piece that gets glued to it. This is what the piece looks like raw, and I gotta say, gluing these two sections together were quite difficult because they are quite flimsy and, and they and quite bendy, and when you're trying to install them, they're just going around all over the place, and you can't really jig it because then the stuff will stick to the, the glue will, will adhere to the clamp, and then when you're trying to remove the clamp, you're just going to break more stuff. This is the type of thing you have to glue on one little corner, wait for it to fully set, and then just spot tack glue it until finally you have the whole piece glued like this here. Obviously, this is going to need quite a little bit of body work, but this is something that could easily be done, or not, or I should say relatively easily be taken care of with some sandpaper, but I am going to go ahead and add another bead of thick super glue in here just to, one, strengthen it up, and also to delete the little seam that we have where the two sections of unit join. This one is just starting on his journey. This guy here, once I snip these guys off here, I could get those glued on and then I could begin with the polishing of the glue sections over here. I already took care of sanding this section down. The rails are nice and smooth at this point, but once this guy's glued in place, I could then tackle this section here. It's a lot to mention in this scene, specifically from one of my standard model showcase videos, but yeah, I do want to mention that because this was definitely something that came out to me as being problematic and someone's working on one of these models for the first time or, or, is, a, or is contemplating on getting one of these builds. Yeah, you definitely want to make sure you have all of your ducks in a row on this one. But more on that as the video goes on and definitely I'll circle back to that at the tail end of the video. Skipping forward a little bit takes it back to the bottom portion of the gypsy rack. At this point here, the bodywork has been concluded and I'm actually ready to start with the assembly. This is very important to mention at this point in the video because, as we saw before, it's a two-piece assembly and there is quite a substantial, not substantial so much, but there is a noticeable seam located in these sections over here and these will ruin the look of the model. So these have to be polished away and it's really, really wise to address that at this time. If you think you can go ahead, assemble the entire rack and then deal with the body works later, you are definitely, definitely mistaken because it will just lead to way more complications and frustration. In order to avoid that, you need to bite this thing off and chew it in small sections. And that's exactly what I did here. So after the units were glued together, as we saw before, I went ahead and did some body work, first with a layer of super glue that was polished down with some fine sandpaper. Then there was still some craters and remembrance left over of the seam. They were... Uh, clogged up with some red putty, to which then that was also hand sanded once dried. Then another layer of super glue was added to make the thing even more smooth, and whatever segments of little pits that were left were done with pinpoint red putty, and then again sanded flush to the way we see it here. And when you're sanding, you have to be very careful. This part's fairly easy because you can use your thumb to reinforce this little cross section. Same with the opposite side. The trick is the part in the middle here. You want to go ahead and brace it here with your fingers, like I am right here. And this will allow you to polish and smooth everything evenly. You want to be careful. Obviously, you don't want to break your little rails. That would not help anybody. But the piece is fairly flexible, so it does have some sway and you can gently sand it down in the format that we have here without causing any collateral damage. 
Again, if you think you could do this once the thing is fully assembled, you are definitely going to be in for a world of hurt. So now that this unit here is fully polished down and sanded away, that also includes some sanding on the inside as well. I'm ready for the, the rest of the assembly. The other parts are still on the runners. And one thing I do want to mention is that this backing that we have here, there are some sections that need to be snipped away and polished away before you can actually remove it off the sprue. Again, it just makes it easier that way and less likelihood is there a, a, a potential risk of damage. Uh, the other thing to mention are the sinkholes, not sinkholes, uh, injection pin marks. There's two on either side right here and here. This one here was plugged up with some putty. Putty was at this one here, but it was sanded completely flush. After the body work is done, you're then ready to start the assembly. And again, pace yourself, take your time, move in slow, methodical manner, and you should be able to navigate through these waters pretty well. Let's go ahead and get this thing built. Hopping forward a little bit takes us to the rack starting to go up in its shape. And if you're watching and saying to yourself, wow, John, you're spending a lot of time on this video with this rack, you're absolutely correct. And that's for absolutely good reason, because so far from what I've seen on this model over here, this is the build. The remainder of the tank goes together fairly easily until you get to the grab rails that I mentioned before and the gypsy rack. This is going to be the bulk of the difficulty found on the build. This is where you are going to have to pace yourself and you're going to have to have your skill sets in a row. Otherwise, you're, well, going to have a bad time. Since the previous scene, of course, the bodywork was taken care of and the upper lower sections here are fused as one and then it's time to start assembling the cross members for the remainder of the rail sections the cross members go on pretty well with the way the kit is designed there's this little notch found on these sections here and they plug into those little notches that were present on the unit as we saw before after two pieces are glued together the notches lined up pretty well for the most part. Obviously, if this depends on how much filler or glue you have in those sections over there, that could potentially cause some problems. But if you are careful with the way you apply the putty and also with the adhesives, you should be able to get the piece to fit in more or less all right. Once the pieces are fit in place, again, let it dry and the, you have a number of units. There are, what, one, two, three, four, five total. These two here are found on the one runner. They just plug on. Then the other ones are important because they have these hinges on them, and you have to be careful not to mix which one goes where this is relevant. After these pieces get glued in place, I also went ahead and installed the rear section on. As I mentioned before, bodywork was done hit this to remove any sort of injection pins. And oh, also on the side sections here, they are molded nicely. However, on one of the sides, you will have some injection marks to contend with. These are protruding from the surface, so you really have to polish them down with a needle file just to make sure that they're smooth because if they're not, it's going to inhibit the actual installation of the other parts that follows. And you have to use a needle file for that. There's no other way to do it. Potentially some sandpaper, but a needle file is probably one of the most efficient ways. And when you're doing that, you got to make sure you don't break something. And these things are fairly molded, so you have to be careful with the pressure application because you could snap the part. So just warning you right now. Once the pieces are fit into place, you're going to let the glues dry. And this is paramount because the alignment of these sections need to be straight as possible. If they're canted one way or another, well, gonna have a bad time. Those sections are found on these two runners over here. It's the same runner, just in duplicate. And there goes your rail itself. As I may have mentioned before, there are some little sacrificial pieces of plastic need to be amputated out and then you have to blend them away and that's best done before you remove it off the sprue and from here now I can actually remove the unit off the sprue and then fit it in place. One thing that I'm not going to do at this time is thoroughly deburr them because of rails being what they are. You don't want to deburr them when they're off of the runner. You want to deburr them oddly enough after they've already been glued in place. You're going to install the, the component and let the glues fully set and dry and then once you're done with that it is at that point there you could go ahead and start with the polishing. Why I recommend this trick is because well it's way stronger when it's glued and assembled on the rack as opposed to running around loose like the way we have here. And these things are just asking to get broken during removal yet alone polishing. So once it's glued in place, it's much stronger, much more rigid, and you could easily just go over the surfaces with some fine sandpaper and that'll 
really do a fantastic job with blending away the nubs that are remaining from the sprue. I'm gonna go ahead and take care of that off camera, and then we can cut across to where this thing here is ready for the next step, because we're not out of the neck of the woods yet. And here's the rack, fully assembled, not quite ready for installation. I do have to deburr the rails, but here's what the thing looks like once fully and properly assembled. So the rails went on without eight, without too much problems. The best way to do it is you have to piecemeal it where you actually tack glue it on each piece at a time. And then by the time you get to the last section over here, you glue the last section and everything is self-supporting. For the glue, I use my thin super glue right over here, Amazon link in the description. And the way the application is done is not with the nozzle. No, 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 specifically after a while, these nozzles get pretty gnarly and uh, they never really hold up all that well. But instead, in order to get precise glue application, I do the old James Bond uh, ninja poison technique where you take the cap off, you dip the uh, thin piece of wire inside of the glue, and then when the wires pulled out, you have a small little drop of glue all the way on the end. And then that's used as a surgical precise way to add a finite small little drop of glue as surgically as possible to the desired location. Because this stuff dries almost on contact, it doesn't take too long to tack weld or tack glue everything in place. Once the rack is done, I then went ahead and added the next thing which is outside of the kit confines which is the meshwork on the inside. The M1 Gypsy Rack just like many other vehicles does have a mesh floor found on the bottom portion of the rack just to prevent crap from falling through and the meshwork is not supplied with the Dragon kit. So this is something that you are going to have to leave the confines of the kit in order to add. In my opinion it's one of those additions that really really polishes up the build and it looks so much better with than without but if you don't have the material or the capabilities it would be best probably just to admit. The mesh on this particular example here is this stuff that I have right here. I don't recall where this came from. I found it in my spare bin. More likely came from another 135th scale tank that I built in the past. But, you know, hey, that's why it helps to keep spare parts on hand. The mesh was then cut to shape, and cutting mesh is a art form in itself. Actually, mesh in general is an art form and a specialty and a discipline in its own right. Cutting the stuff is problematic, getting it fit is even trickier, getting it glued in place, you bet that adds some difficulty, and that's not including prime paint and even varnishing. Everywhere I just mentioned you could easily botch a mesh job and it'll just ruin the looks. So starting with the cutout, I was able to carefully cut the thing out to the appropriate shape. Then the next thing I had to do is I had to cut the little incisions here in the mesh in order so it could fit into these brackets. And this is something that can lead to some problems specifically for people out there that don't really have a whole lot of expertise in this. So one little hack that I did was I took the unit, I put it on this piece of scrap paper here, I traced it out with a sharpie and I put an indentation where each of these little uh, rigidity sections must go. I then took the mesh that at the time was already cut out to shape and test fitted a hundred different times from Sunday and I went ahead lined it up made the incisions in the appropriate locations and then everything was able to just slip into place like you see here. For the application of the adhesives again I used the thin super glue with the ninja poison method in order to carefully tack glue everything where it needs to go. This is the type of thing where the glue needs to be thin has to be added precisely and surgically just like the remainder of the gypsy rack and as the piece goes it'll you have to straighten line it up or else it will have be really really wavy you can have some waves in it as these things get dinged up pretty easily but there is a, a threshold to the point where it becomes problematic uh, as you're going through you're gluing it in the appropriate locations and then once you're done this year is the final outcome. The next thing I'm going to do is polish down this section here with the sandpaper and I'm also going to have to wash away the sharpie marks. This has to be done because this will poke out through the paint. So to do that I got my 320 grit sandpaper right here and I'm just going to go ahead and just lightly go over these areas and as you can see it's polishing down the burrs found on the rails. like so. As I mentioned before, now that the unit is fully assembled, it is much more robust compared to the way we had it before. 
And you can see how in one fell swoop, you can go ahead and take care of the, the remembrance on the sprue, or fr from the sprue when it was mounted in the box. You just gotta go over up and down with your finger occasionally, use your finger as a gauge to feel where there's any high points or any sorts of imperfections. And just focus accordingly. You, want to, you don't want to focus too much on one area because then that could add a flat or a ding. And this is something that could lead to some more problems. Also, you can see I'm taking care of the Sharpie that was mentioned before. Just some light sanding. That's all you need. And in about no time, you should have... The gypsy rack now fully complete and at this point here this thing is ready for installation so as you can see take your time carefully apply the glues where you need to let the thing dry that's the most important aspect must let it dry and then as soon as and if you take your time you pace yourself you should be able to successfully assemble one of these gypsy racks without any problems also, something I want to mention about the build involves the sprockets. Here we have the kit supplied sprockets and they were assembled. The kit sprockets assembled very well. The timing lines up very good on them, which is something that's fantastic. You'll be surprised how many kits out there where the timing is askew and <laughs> good luck trying to get the tracks to fit on something like that. That wasn't the problem here. They went on pretty well. The one addition and modification I made was with the mud slits. As I mentioned earlier on in the video, and it's also seen, and it's a common thing seen on many other kits out there, namely the ones on the Patton family uh, tree, is that the sprockets do not have the mud flips generally present on them with the out-of-the-box tooling so for this one over here i had to add it and this was added much along the same ways as i do on my m60 and m48 builds where i carefully mark the locations with a pencil on the lathe and then i carefully drill out the according or the appropriate locations on the abrams the geometry is very different compared to the Patton, where those are just ovals while on the abrams here there are these strange looking half moon squish circle cutouts and this is done again with the dremel with a micro router bit the bit itself is found on the vendor listed below hang on let me go ahead and grab the actual bit that i used right here here's the stuff that's actually the vendor as well so these are the router bits that i used on the build not this one this guy is is odd man out these are the, these are the ones here and these ones are really great at drilling them out you have to be careful this is a technique that does require skill and it does require the right amount of tools because if you do not have a steady hand or skills to this you could easily mess up one of these sprockets and that's the case you're really really screwed so it's one of those things where if you have the 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 skill sets to do it rock on and if you don't just admit it's better to leave it in a stock configuration than to dick up the sprockets. Also, unlike the M60 and the M48, where there are examples out there of the drum housings that do not have the mud slits in pr place on the Abrams, that's not the case. The Abrams all have the mud slits present. So this is something that you have to have, dot, 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 if you have the expertise and the skills to do so. If you don't, just sit this one out and just roll with it in its stock configuration and more or less you'll be all right. But if you really want to take it to the next step, sprockets here is a great way to do that. And of course you'll see this after everything is painted and weathered. And after the bustle bin is attached, the tank at this point here is ready for painting and that feels really good to say. So let's just briefly just look at some of the parts. On the runners, you'll notice that the suspension, I should say the road wheels are unassembled and they get painted on the sprues. This is a common tactic that I do. One thing I've seen commonly done on many YouTube videos, and again, it just blows my mind, is people go ahead, assemble and install them onto the tank, along with the track in most cases, and then try to paint around it. That's nonsense. Don't do that, it's a terrible technique. If you just wanna have bare exposed areas of plastic showing through, that's what you're gonna get, don't do that. It's best to paint everything off the model and then assemble at the tail end. And that's literally how they do it in the real, uh, in real life. So that's the best way to do it. On the wheels themselves, on the back portion here, there were some flash and some injection marks. And these were polished with just some sandpaper, just went up and down the surfaces. There is still a little bit of flash remaining on these stems, but I could 
uh, I could just uh, clean those off and carve them off with an exacto when it comes time for removal and installation. The other thing I want to mention about the wheels are these two return rollers over here. The Abrams return rollers are perforated and these perforations are integrally molded on and that's nice. However, they're just molded flat so we just have indentations and with a pin vise I just went ahead and drilled them out completely completing the look that we have here. Simple trick to do and one that will greatly improve the model overall. Even though you don't see it admittedly, but it's one of those things that makes you feel good. <laughs> Both of these techniques were done to the two sprues here. As for the the side skirts, I removed them off of the sprue and these are going to be painted again off the model just like the other parts for the same reason I mentioned. On some builds I actually leave the side skirts on the sprues as it makes handling and painting a bit easier. However, on this one, I went ahead and removed them just because I don't want to have to touch up little areas of sprue that need to be removed and sanded away. And it's better to do that when it's not on the sprue. Uh, it, both techniques will work, it's just you have to pay more attention one way where you have to touch everything up after it's painted and weathered, as opposed to this way over here where you're going to have to try to line everything up on some on some double face tape in order to complete the, the camo, making sure everything t uh, is seamless. Each has their pros, each has their cons, both are doable, and I have utilized both in the past. The MGs over here, they have been partially assembled. There is an ammo can that is still going through seam removal right now. That is going to be installed after the unit is fully painted, obviously with that installed in place. Kind of gets in the way, and it's one of those things I like to paint separately. The remainder of the MG detailing is pretty good. I did drill this, the front section out with a pin vise, as I usually do, and we'll see what this looks like in its completed state momentarily. Same is also true with the M240 that you can see right here. I already mentioned the sprockets, and as for the tank, looks like it's sad right now. I did, by the way, put a little drop of Elmer's glue on the inner portion of the trunnion just to stiffen it up, because I was encountering some droop on this model. Uh, just like you can see here, the glue's still wet. Uh, right now, this is, by the way, not glued in place. The reason why is because on the inner confines over here, you, paint will have difficulty getting to these recesses, as well as also on the inner chunk here of the mantlet. So it's best to paint or prime and paint these off the model just to make sure everything is thoroughly painted. One thing I always stress on these on my builds is making sure the thing is thoroughly painted. And I'm talking from a place of experience. I've already made basically all the mistakes out there, so I'm, uh, I could point out exactly what to watch out for. And on these M1s, you will get paint not into these areas over here. It's very easily done. So it's best to paint it off the model. As for the bustle rack, there you go. It's installed. It dropped right into place. No fitting or manhandling required. So everything just lined up pretty well. And once it's painted and weathered, it's going to look great. The only bit of detailing I'm going to add next, I'll probably be adding it either before or slightly after it gets painted, are cast rest and springs here for the antenna bases. Although technically, admittedly, it probably is incorrect because the Abrams generally has this one certain type of antenna base. Name will lose me at the moment. I'll go ahead and throw a picture of it up here on the, on the screen. However, I don't have any of those on hand specifically in 135. So I'm just going to roll with the standard uh, AES or the other type of antenna base, the one that typically see on USAFE. Technically, it could be installed on the Abrams. However, in actuality, I've never really seen that. But since the kit does give you the bottom portion of said bases, I might as well just top it off with those spring units. But if you are building one of these and you want to go for more accuracy, I would recommend trying to find a replacement aftermarket set of the appropriate antenna bases for this vehicle. Here we are going towards the end of the construction on this project. At this point, the hull and the turret have been painted, camouflaged, and weathered, and the wheels are following suit. During the assembly, though, one thing that I noticed was that the wheels do need a slight bit of hand fitting just to get them to seat properly. And what I mean by that is, well, we have two examples over here. This one here is still left stock, and I'm going to try to show exactly what happens if you try to plug it together. The reason why I'm showing this right now is because in case anyone does have this kit and are trying to assemble the wheels, as you can see, they don't exactly fit. <laughs> or if they do fit, the tolerances are very, very, very snug. And this is something that is commonly seen on older tooling kits. I'm no stranger to this. I've built lots of old Tamiya's from the 70s. And this is something that you tend to see sometimes. Also, these ones here, they do have an added layer of primer and paint on the surface, which also makes the fit a bit snug and 
what, part of the reason why I'm sh mentioning this at this time is because if you encounter this on your build, don't just try to manhandle it and force it in place. It's just going to potentially lead to issues where the piece isn't going to seat properly and that's going to open up a litany of problems. But also, it will potentially cause damage to the wheel because you could potentially crack these things. And that's definitely, again, not something that you want to have happen to you. So, on this example over here, you can see that this has been cleaned up. And if I take this unit here, you'll see that it fits perfectly where it needs to go. And, oh, hang on, there, there we go. Now it fits perfect, per, uh, perfectly where it needs to go. So in order to get the piece prepped, I'll go ahead and show you how to do that. In order to get the paint off, wow, this piece is on really well. <laughs> All right. In order to get the paint off, I actually used the lathe for this. And this is something I am going to show the procedure how to do. And in addition to using the lathe, I'm actually going to use also the hobby knife here, which is going to use, be used to scrape the paint off, and I used a lathe for that, and you'll see why in a moment. If you do not have a lathe for this, it could still be done. You could just you know, to use a hobby knife or a needle file and just going to make a bunch of passes until finally whittle it down to the piece does finally fit. The problem with doing it by hand is you have to be a little bit more cautious because the piece does need to be, or the material needs to be removed evenly, otherwise the wheel is going to be a bit canted. So that's something that someone shot there should keep in mind. The best way to do this is on the lathe, and I'll show you why right now. With the camera readjusted, you can see my lathe right here. And I'm going to go ahead and put the wheel in the chuck. It's a bit tricky to do with the camera in the way, but basically when you put the wheel in the chuck, you want to make sure that it is leveled properly. Otherwise, it's going to be wobbling like this, and that's not exactly something that's going to help you out. You see? Like that. That is bad. You don't want to have that. So, you just basically align it to make sure everything is squared away. And after a minute or so, you will have the piece properly centered. At this point here, it's ready for the adjustments. So, I'm going to be utilizing the Exacto here, or my miniature snap blade. And this is just going to be used just to s scrape off the layer of paint, and also it's going to be used to scrape off just a finite amount of plastic. So I'm going to turn on the lathe, and then I'm going to actually start with the process. And just pay attention to the angle that I hold the knife. That's all there is to it. One thing that's nice that the piece is painted, you instantly know when the paint is fully removed. And as for how much to remove, again, it's not a whole lot. The piece is just a, a is somewhat oversized so that it's a very tight fit. So you just have to remove just a little bit of material and basically you should be good to go. I also removed the material, or I should say the paint, right over here on this flat recess over here where the two wheel sections connect. This is done so that again ensures a nice tight or I should say a nice close fit which is exactly what you want. You don't want to have any gap over here because you can throw off the wheel alignment. And I also for good measure add a small little cut as a bevel right here on the corner which makes the parts seat in in a much more efficient manner. If I get the thing off of the lathe, blow off the little sections of spaghetti that are still left. There you go. This piece here is now ready for assembly. After a small little drop of glue was added to each of those two sides on the stem, the part just clips directly in place as the kit intended. So from here, I'm actually gonna go ahead and get the units 
varnished. The model at this point has already been decaled. And the reason why I'm going to do that at that time is actually because of the center hubcaps. On the M1 Abrams, the center hubcaps are actually made out of clear plastic. A lot of people tend to forget that. And on the model over here, I'm going to be rep or I should say mimicking the look of the clear plastic by painting the little hubcaps gloss black. The reason why I'm going with gloss black is because, well, the whole point of the clear hubcaps so that you could see the oil volume on the inside. And the oil turns black after a while, so having the units representing gloss black is a perfect way to mimic the clear plastic lens found on these sections. In order to paint these sections over here, obviously the, the model is getting varnished and it's a matte varnish, so there's no point going ahead painting these units black at this time, varnishing and then going over with some clear coat. That's just adding extra layers on top of detailing. It's not really a, a benefit to do. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and first varnish, then I'll be able to paint the tires, as well as the hubcap, and then I can go ahead and get the gloss black, or I should say the gloss coat on the certain sections. This is where everyone's opinion may vary on the orientation on this, but long as you, basically all roads lead to the same ending, no, there's no real correct way to do it. That's just the way I'm going to go about it on this particular build. For the return rollers over here, I might as well mention these at this time because once the tank gets the side search, you're not going to see these anymore. These are steel. There's no rubber rim on these, so I'm actually going to put a swipe of silver paint on these, as I generally do on my steel rimmed road wheels. But no point getting that on camera. Let's go ahead and, well, continue to where the model is finished. Here we are at the very tail end of the build. At this point here, the tracks have been fitted in place and the side skirts are soon to be mounted. But before I do, I just wanted to highlight this one section because once the skirts go on, you're not really going to get a good look at all the stuff now on the intersection. So here you can see the tracks fit in place. These are the Ryfield Model 1s that I referenced earlier in the video. And these things are awesome, absolutely worth it. They're a little complex to put together, but if you have the time and the patience, they definitely will enhance the model and are leagues better than the trash Lincoln Link tracks that are supplied with the kit. You see how they time around the sprocket, they look great. And also at this point here, you get to see the row wheels with the oil filler caps fitted in place, or I should say the clear hub caps painted to render the clear sections I mentioned before. Note the center fastener is actually the color of the tank. That's something you want to keep aware of when you're doing these type of fittings. On the two top return rollers, you get to see what they look like with their steel color that I referenced before. And you also get to see what they look like fit in place with the track, how it hugs around these sections. One other thing to mention about the tracks is that this being an M1A2 Abrams from the 90s time frame, the Bigfoot pattern track is more than appropriate. This is in contrast to some of the earlier generation of M1 Abrams that had the directional rubber chevron type track, which was similar in design and shape to what we saw on the earlier American tanks like the M47, the M48, and the M60. This pattern here, it's directionalist, so you have no idea which direction the tank was driving if you come across the tank tracks impressed onto the dirt surface where the tank was driven. If anyone's interested to know more about the actual review and assembly of these tracks here, I recommend checking out the review tutorial video for the Ryfield Models Abrams tracks that are going to be posted on the ECA channel shortly after this video here makes its debut. And from here, now that you've got a glimpse of the vehicle under the skirts, let's go ahead and get this thing looking a bit more proper by go ahead and throwing the skirts on and then I could progress with the last of the details, bring the model up to final completion. No point getting that on camera though, let's cut across when that's already been accomplished. And this takes us to the sprockets. Here you can see the sprocket with the mud slits now in its final format. And again, this is a great way to add just more flavor and more accuracy to the build. Granted, if you have the techniques and the tools in order to go for it. One other thing to mention about the sprocket is how well the aftermarket track times with it. The Ryfield track times absolutely flawlessly with the Dragon sprocket. So there are going to be absolutely no fit issues if you utilize these tracks to enhance your Dragon build. As I mentioned before, these tracks are absolutely recommended, if not arguably required, in order to build one of these things out from start to finish. Which brings us neatly along to this side skirts, and this is where the build definitely 
has some shortcomings. So the first thing I do want to mention is the absence of the interior details that are found on the hull that on the real vehicle would actually support these things in place. In case anyone's curious on what they look like, I would recommend checking out my 116 M182 Abrams build that I recently published where I go over in that detail in more depth. But needless to say, in order to have all these pieces mounted to the side of the vehicle. There are these support arms that are found on the inside, and these details are absent on this generation here of Dragon Kit. Dragon would eventually revisit and retool their Abrams models in the mid-2000s, and when they did that, they went ahead and actually incorporated those details in place. But if you're working on one of these old school first generation ones, those details are going to be admitted, which again is actually on par in what we saw with the other kits that were available from the same era, again being from Academy as well as Tamiya. The fit issues, by the way, were not just found on the one side, but were present on both sides of the vehicle. And if you're ever building one of these, I cannot stress enough, you definitely want to pay attention to the skirts. Make sure you hand fit them and make sure they fit on in an appropriate manner. Specifically prior to the thing heading off into paint. The other thing to mention that I negated to mention before is that on the hull over here, there's this weird wacky line that is integrally molded on. And if I was to take a guess, I believe that is a suggestion point for the mine plow attachment that Dragon also offered on one of their other Abrams kits. However, on the real M1, that type of indent is not present. So if you are building one of these kits, you will have to address this area here and delete that molded in section. It's easily done with a little smear of putty or thick super glue and some hand polishing and you're good to go. But it is something that you should definitely be aware of. With the way the piece is molded, it appears that it's actually replicating some sort of a weld line, but that is definitely not the case. The geometry is off and it's definitely something that would hurt the build as opposed to helping it. As you can see with this one over here, that has already been taken care of or it took care of it during the course of the construction, leaving for the smooth appearance that we see here, which would be more prototypical to the real vehicle. Also on this section, you want to definitely do not forget the rubber front sections of the tin work. The Abrams, just like with the M60, had these rubber sections found right here. And these are decently rendered on the Dragon tooling. The only thing the builder has to do is paint and weather it accordingly. When you're painting them, don't do the rookie mistake on just painting the outside, but also don't forget to paint the inside as well. As if you rotate the model into a certain light, you will actually be able to see quite visibly the interior section of what would normally be rubber on the real unit. Heading towards the rear section, basically what you see here is all stock, and you get to see what it looks like with its coat of paints added. And the pieces are very nicely rendered out for the tooling of the era, and I would argue they still hold up pretty well even today. The mesh work here on the grill work looks really, really good, and it takes the Tamiya panel line accent very excellently. When you are working on an Abrams, by the way, as a quick side note, when you're doing the exhaust soot effects, you only want to add it to the middle section that we have here. These two sections are not for the exhaust, only the center portion is. So when you're going in there with the airbrush, adding your soot effects, this pane here is the only one that you want to add those effects to. Outside of that, nothing really much to mention over here, except for the tail lights. You get to see what they look like in their final form. And the tail lights are very nicely rendered on this really old kit. And again, it's one of those aspects of this kit that aged very well. If I bring the vehicle closer, you get to see the paintwork. And when you're painting one of these tail lights, you want to make sure that you thoroughly paint the lenses. A lot of people will either not paint it, or if they do paint it, they paint the whole thing red, which neither of which are doing you any favors. But the tail light cluster is actually composed of three lights. So the biggest is the one here on the top, which of course would be red. Then we have two smaller sliver lights that we have here and here, and these would be silver on the real units. So a little swipe of silver paint was added with a very fine point paintbrush. This again is another one of those locations where you want to have a very good quality paintbrush when applying it. If your paintbrush is fraying or it's a bit old and it's not really holding up too well, you definitely don't want to use something like that for an application like this as things can go sideways very quickly. Aside from this one over here, you get to see what the one looks like on the opposite side. Remember on this vehicle here, I utilize what I believe is called the APU box, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> don't jump down my throat if anyone's an Abrams guy out there and I, and I miss id this unit over here. But regardless, this is what it looks like in its final format with the other taillight installed. The unit just gets installed without any sort of problems and it looks pretty good in its final format. Of course, this entire unit here was applied 
after the model was thoroughly painted and weathered. This was just to make sure that there's no missed areas of paint on this intersection over here, which can easily happen due to the tight confines. Also, you can see a power cord emerging from the rear of the hull going into the APU box just to give just a little bit of extra detailing. Just one last thing I want to mention about the taillights is I love how the brush guards have that notch cut out on the intersection over here. Of course, it's also found on the one on the opposite side. And these details here are something that really make this kit much more advanced compared to the other kits that were available on the market during the time that these kits were in production. If anyone's ever seen the Tamiya one, it is just a tube that comes out of the rear portion of the hull here, much along the same lines as it was on the old school Eshi. Moving topside takes to the driver's hatch. Like I mentioned before, the piece was modified to be fully functional. And here's what it looks like in the open position. It's a pretty useless bit of detailing and feature, but again, it's a why not accessory. Since I had the opportunity, I might as well do it. And having done it, it definitely makes for a better build in my opinion. The piece just hinges open and when I want to close it, I just want to go ahead and push it with a little stick here until finally it drops into its appropriate location. Simple, sweet. Nothing much more you want out of that. Also on this side over here, you get to see that little handle that I had to replace earlier. The new metal handle just fits the bill absolutely perfectly. And just adds a nice little bit of detailing in that section. It's one of these little bits of detailing that are commonly either broken or are forgotten about on a lot of builds out there. So if you're working on an Abrams build, be sure you go ahead and remember to have that little handle in its place. On the rear portion of the hull brings us, of course, to the engine deck, and what you see here is completely stock. Nothing outside of what I mentioned before was done here. The units really hold paint very well, and the grill work, as well as all the seam work, is excellent when it comes time for the panel line accent. Because of how everything is deeply molded, the accent just runs into these locations over here, and it really highlights everything once it's fully set. Continuing upward brings us to the turret. So the first thing I'm gonna start with is the 120. As I mentioned before, the 120 was a two-piece assembly, so you do have some seam work to contend with, and as you can see, once the seam work is dealt with, it leads for a nice seamless result. The 120 goes together pretty well. It's on par with basically most of the other kits from that era, and even today for that matter. The only thing is when you are working on one of these, you have to be careful during the seam removal because of all of the little ridges and other little details that are found on the top and bottom portion of this type of unit. They can easily be over polished away, and this is also not doing you any favors. This is really the biggest obstacle when it comes to painting a modern barrel like this. And well, this one's actually fairly easy. Probably the hardest are the ones from either the British or the Israelis where you have tons of straps and buckles and all that good stuff. And that requires a bit more work and finesse. On the 120 here, it's much more simpler, but you still have to watch out for those key areas. The removal process was of course done with a needle file and some sandpaper and after a few passes here or there it did a great job with the final end result refining it to the point that we have here. On the muzzle section here of the 120 you'll see that I went ahead and painted the inner portion here with a little swipe of silver paint. This is one technique that a lot of people tend to forget about on their build, specifically on a vehicle like this that has quite a large muzzle diameter. On the real unit, of course, there would be no paint in these sections. It would be just the metal color. And with the 120 being a smooth board, this is something definitely to consider. So this was really easily done. Just a little swipe of silver paint was really all that was required. And once added in place, it definitely makes the build that much more polished. Moving rearward takes to the mantlet where we have first the coax and as I mentioned before I drilled this section out in order to give it the hollow effects that you see here and since I was done with the lathe it did a fantastic job with making that hole nice and concentric and also having some very scale thickness of material around the outer portion. The other thing to note about the coax is that when you're installing them this is one of those components that are probably one of the last bits of equipment to be added to the vehicle because of the weathering when you're weathering it it's easier to add the powder fouling to the appropriate location as opposed to when it's already fitted in place you can still do it but it's more easily done before the installation so on the abrams the tube section is sitting above the mantlet that we have here and then we have these like fork type standoffs that have a bit of airspace in between the two sections. Because of that, when the 240 coax is fired, it does build up powder fouling, but only on the most rear portion here of the mantlet. And by having the piece off, this allows you to get full access with the airbrush to add said pow powder fouling effects without having it go up the tube. So when you uh, finally add the component, it has a very realistic result like you see here. 
The other thing to mention about the mantlet is with the top portion here with these mounts, you'll see that I went ahead and drilled them out with a pin vise in order to get the appropriate details. This is a common feature that is commonly, again, overlooked on most M1s out there on the market, specifically from the older generation, and most of the time they just mold these things as solid. On the real unit, these would be hollow as these are actually tie down points for some kind of bit of equipment. And in order to get that extra accuracy, just a, a pin vise with a small Dremel bit will get you some good results. On the tongue that's here on the top, there are actually two holes side by side. And again, these details were added with a small pin vise. Once everything is applied though, you really get to see how much more improved it is compared to just leaving it absent. Moving our way to the turret sides, like I mentioned before, this was probably one of the most difficult aspects of the turret, outside from the gypsy rack itself, but with everything in its final form, you really got to see how well it polished up in the end. As we can recall, with the suggestion points for the rods over here, they were kind of in the wrong place, so I had to add some super glue into these sections in order to plug them up, and then I had to go through the bodywork in order to blend everything nice and smooth, and as you can see, it actually turned out quite well as did the remainder of the side rails with their fabrication as well. As for the tow cable, this is the kit supply one and it mounts on in the location that you see here. Basically, there are just some suggestion points and you more or less just fit the piece on until finally it finds that sweet spot and you're good to go. These of course were painted off of the model, it just made for an easier paint and assembly in that manner. The exact same type of features were found on the reverse side, again for the same reason as I mentioned before. But now that the model is in its final format, you really get to appreciate all of the deburring effects and other effects that I was referencing earlier. On that note, this also brings us to the smoke grenade launcher. Like I said before, it's a multi-piece assembly and once you properly remove the seam work, it makes for a nice detail component overall. And you also get to appreciate those deeper holes that I drilled into the grenade sections that I was also referencing earlier in the video. On the tow cables themselves, I painted them my usual format where the middle section is just a steel cable and the end connectors are painted either with a olive green or an olive drab coloring. This is a, again, a simple way to add a bit of extra color pop to the build as generally these cable eye sections are painted with some sort of color, either be it NATO green, olive green, or possibly even desert sand or tan. Either of those colors will greatly improve the model as opposed to just even leaving everything just flat black that again a lot of people out there tend to do on their builds. Continuing rearward takes it to that rear section. Like I mentioned before this required a little bit of shimming here and there in order to get the piece to fit and now that everything is painted it turned out quite well. And on that note this brings us to the gypsy rack itself as I spent quite a chunk of this video going over the fabrication of this section here and as you can see it turned out awesome. The seam that was basically plaguing this thing several times during the build has been completely blended away and as you can see it is totally smooth. These notches that you see on the rear portion are fine, you don't want to plug those up. And the reason why Dragon went with this design is because on the interior portion over here we have that tube structure that would be found on the interior portion of the gypsy rack rail itself. And with the molding technology of the air, that was probably the best way to do it. Although it didn't make your job as a builder easier, at the final end result, it actually came out pretty well. The rails are also perfectly mounted and deburred, as well as also the mesh work that I was referencing before. As you can see, the mesh came out absolutely perfect. No paint buildup or varnish built up or found these sections over here. And this is basically nearly perfect of an install and final end result of a meshwork on a gypsy rack. Like I mentioned before, plugged up holes on these meshworks here are a killer on gypsy racks in 135. And the if you play your cards right and you have your techniques down, you could pull it off and it'll actually really improve the build. With the meshwork added, this definitely improves the build tenfold as opposed to just leaving it absent. Also on the rear section here, you can see the 50 cal ammo cans. I went ahead and added a little yellow lettering, or a, bri a bridge lettering, I should say, with a small little paintbrush. And 
it does the job. I think it looks great when you do that. It just adds a little bit more extra color contrast and pop to the bill as opposed to just leaving the ammo cans just totally olive green, which that wouldn't be the case. They always have some sort of yellow ID lettering on them. And if you don't have access to a decal sheet that has that, some little very tiny little dots with a fine point paintbrush will basically yield the same effects. For those who are a little bit more, shall we say, picky that are out there, there are decal sheets that have all this information, and I'll recommend getting one of those if you definitely want to take the build to the next level. Also on the rear section here, you get to see the nice detailing integrally molded into this rear plate. Came out absolutely perfect. These sections here just take in that, to me, a panel line accent and just amplifies the build really, really nicely. Which brings it at this point here to the antenna bases. As I mentioned before, this one here technically is an error with my build, as these antenna bases would not necessarily be the type that you would find on an M1, as I mentioned earlier. But having the spring detailing added, it just definitely improves them all, fleshing it out, making it look more complete, as opposed to leaving them absent or just drilling a hole and sticking a wire in it, which is not doing yourself any favors. For the springs, I actually painted them, uh, well, the springs themselves are cast resin, as I mentioned before. I have a cast resin mold out there that I use just for builds like this or similar to this. And I just drill it out with a pin vise so I could add in the antenna wire. As for the paintwork, I want to give a shout out to one of my great viewers out there that that notified me and let me know that on many modern era vehicles, the spring is actually a NATO black type coloring and the wire itself would be NATO green. So I went ahead and followed his advice as I've done on several other builds in the past. But you know who you are out there if you're watching this. Thank you for that awesome tip. Moving upward takes to the million dollar blowout panels. Again, what you see here is totally stock and the Dragon Kit is excellent. Nicely molded in details and everything just holds up paint very, very nicely. The only thing you want to be careful of as a builder when you're applying the layers of paint and primer is to make sure that the thinness of said paints is nice and dialed in because if it's too thick, you're going to potentially overpaint some of these nice fine details. And again, you're not doing yourself any favors in that regard. Continuing rearward takes us to the loader's hatch and we have this nice little ring over here on all M1s. This ring is a distinctive color where it is this shiny black polished type material because this is a ring that the M240 can actually slide on. And on every single M1 I've ever seen, specifically ones in service, they are always this color that we have here. For the color itself, I painted it with just, to me, a flat black via the paintbrush and then I dry brushed the scratched metal effects that you see here leading for the end result. As for the loader's hatch itself, it's just glued in the static position that we have here. You can't really make it functional. It's a bit frail for that. However, the same cannot be said for the commander's cupola hatch. This is actually, it, it can be built in a way that makes it fully functional. Although it's a bit frail, but if you play your cards right, you can still pull it off as I was able to do here. So right there, the piece can open up and hinge in the covered section or you can just open up full like the way I've done just now. It's a nice feature that this kit does have and it doesn't really require the builder to do any sort of crazy modifications to it in order to get this effect. You just have to apply the glue in just some certain key locations or I should say you admit the glue in certain key locations and apply it in others and if you do that you can get the hatch to operate like the way you see on my build here, which is a nice detail to have, and it's one that actually is a cool one. The M1 Abrams has a really cool design hatch where it can open up like that so the tank commander can see outside and his, his crown is indeed protected. Carrying on to the MGs, they paint and weather very, very nicely and are one of the better aspects of this kit, they look really, really good, specifically how they have the little bicycle handlebars here on the back ends. And the only thing you really need to do is carefully paint and weather everything accordingly. On the 50 itself, or the M2HB, the cradle, of course, would be the same color of the tank. And you can see I went ahead and carefully painted everything as such. And this is, again, another area that I've seen a lot of beginners make mistakes on their builds where they just spray paint or paint the entire thing black. That is definitely not the case. Some parts are actually part of the tank, other parts are part of the MG, and to know which parts are the two will definitely assist you in your build in the future. On the MG itself, I basically painted a weather than my usual format, flat black as a base and then dry brushing for the distress look that you see. The ammo cans themselves are a two-piece assembly, and so there's some slight 
seam work to contend with, but this is very easily polished away with a needle file and some sandpaper. And once done, you could then paint and weather things accordingly. Just like with the cradle, there is a small little shelf that we have right over here that wraps around the ammo can, and you want to carefully paint that in a way that's different from the ammo can itself, just so it adds some differentiation. For the other paintwork on the ammo can, of course, I had a little yellow lettering that you can see there, or traces of it, because again, the other sections are covered up by the mount. Same is also true for the M240 that now you can see in better light. And that's all there is for the detailing. This takes us to the paint and the markings. So for the model's paint work, like I mentioned earlier, I love that three-tone NATO camouflage pattern. And for an M1A2 Abrams from the early to mid-1990s time frame, this would be more than appropriate for this vehicle here. The colors themselves are first, it's a mix of both Tamiya and exterior latex. The base coat, which would be the NATO green color, is my own mix of exterior latex that was applied via the airbrush. Of course, before I can do that, the entire model is thoroughly primed with flat black spray paint. The remainder of the paintwork would be Tamiya NATO black as well as Tamiya NATO brown, and these were applied via the airbrush. After the base camouflage work was done, the model progressed into weathering and it received a cocktail of different effects, be it from lightning agents for sun fading, as well as also some other effects being washes and filters. For the lightning effects, this was done with exterior latex cream, uh, my own cream paint that I mixed, and for the Filter effects, these are a mix of various paints from Mission Models as well as also Tamiya. Once everything was applied, these are the end results that you see here. Counter shading is also done in my usual format with the use of an airbrush, done with some diluted flat black from Tamiya. And then the remainder of the weathering is just my typical chipping effects done with the dry brushing technique. The only other thing I want to mention about the paintwork involves the markings. So on this vehicle here, the markings are actually very, very light. And this would be true to form again for vehicles from the 1990s time frame. And basically what you have are just some TONE marks here on the front, as well as also on the rear. And one thing that I always loved about vehicles from this era is that the TONE markings, because they are black and you can't really see them when they're applied to the vehicle with the camouflage, they actually paint these inside of a large little rectangle that we have here. And these little rectangles are something that you see on lots of other vehicles from the time, from from the Abrams to the Bradley to even the LAV 25s and similar. And for this one here, I wanted to add those effects. And in fact, you probably see them on the box art. Unfortunately, unlike some of the Tamiya kits of the era that have the little rectangle integrally built into the decal, for the Abrams here, that's not the case. So I actually went ahead and carefully measured out the markings. I made some stencils and then I applied the paint via a paintbrush. And after a couple coats of a that same cream color that I mentioned before, here we have the end results, and they came out very, very well. The trick when you're doing this is to make sure that the piece is long enough because you actually have to basically lead and kern all the markings in place, which is something that is a bit hairy, specifically if you've never had to set type before, but if you're careful and you're able to line up everything, it yields for some pretty good results. The only other thing I do want to mention though is that on the TONE marking on this side where we have the triangles, these did not hold up with the water slide decal, so I had to go ahead and apply some paint via paintbrush in order to get them to have the look that you see here. Same was also done to the units right here on the front, and again, it turned out quite well. After the markings were added, the entire model was coated with, you guessed it, VMS matte varnish. I absolutely love that product, as I always mention in these videos, and I will continue to use it until the end of time. It gets applied via the airbrush, and once it's applied, it has some very excellent looking results, and just gives the model that extra polished, completed look that you see here. As for the old school decals, they held up extremely well in regards to the varnish work. Obviously the triangles not so much, or I'm not even sure if he even gave me triangles. It's been a while since I built it, but either way, the markings that were applied to the model held up very, very well. And once the varnish was added, it did a phenomenal job in matting everything down, just making them look like they're painted as opposed to being decals. And at the end of the day, there's really nothing more I could possibly wanted out of this build. It basically came out as well as I have originally anticipated. The, even though the model did throw some curveballs at me, I wasn't expecting some of the difficulty in certain locations that I've already mentioned 
already in this video, but I was still able to persevere, and even though the the areas just require a little bit of extra attention, they weren't anything that were impossible to tackle, it was just one that required just a little bit of extra time and a little bit of finesse. But the planets all lined up, and the build definitely turned out to be a nice one in that regard. I'm also pretty grateful that I got to this build later as opposed to sooner because I doubt I had the capabilities or the skill sets required to go through those sections that I mentioned earlier in this video and to get the model built up to the condition that we have here. And that is the perfect point, if I didn't say so myself, to pivot us into skill level and recommendation. So straight out of the gate, if you are a beginner modeler, and you're looking for an Abrams, this is not going to be the kit for you. Absolutely not. Don't even humor the idea. It's just, no, it's just not going to work out for you. You are definitely not going to have a good time. Even if you are an intermediate builder, some intermediate builders out there may not necessarily have the skill sets to throw one of these together. If you've built about six or even about a dozen 135s, this build here will still be able to give you some difficulty with in regards to some of the features, namely the gypsy rack that I mentioned earlier in the video. If you've built about 15 or 20 builds at that point there, I think you should be able to have your skill sets up to the point where you could start handling some of those finer fiddly bits of techniques that I was touching upon before. If you're an advanced builder, yes, you can most certainly tackle one of these builds. How, although many advanced builders out there tend to want to have something that has some higher detail fidelity, and if that's you, perhaps this older kit here may not necessarily be something that you're looking for, and in fact, you're probably going to be wanting to get something with more modern tooling. But having said that, just as a pure build, yes, a advanced builder can easily tackle, well, not easily, but definitely be able to tackle one of these kits. The number one caveat, and if anyone has watched any of my other videos on Dragon Kits and similar, you'll know that the one caveat I'll say is that the stock track has to go. Individual Lincoln Lake track are crap, no matter how quote-unquote good they are. So if you're getting one of these kits, be sure to pick up a set of aftermarket tracks from one make or another. The Rifle ones, absolutely excellent. But the other option on the market that's still just as viable is a set from AFV Club, a bit older, a bit simpler to put together, but yield for some excellent results and built quicker compared to the Ryfield example. Also, if you are going with the aftermarket track, of course, not only does this bump up the budget a little bit because you have to buy the new track, but this also adds to the complexity of the build because now you have to deal with the assembly of the tracks which you have to go with the assembly of the tracks anyway, even if you're rolling with the stock one, so you're not really losing much in that, but you're just gaining so much better results with the workable ones. I cannot stress that enough. Outside of that, there are lots of aftermarket accessories that can also be added to one of these builds here. There is a ton of stuff on the market that have been developed for this particular kit. Since this kit is as old it is, as it is, there's plenty of aftermarket parts out there from cast resin, turned aluminum, photo etched, nowadays 3D print. So there's quite a lot of options available to spice up one of these older builds. However, of course, as I always mention these videos, that is best left up to discretion of the builder if they deem that this older kit here can be beneficial of having a facelift or two. Outside of the tracks, the tracks, no, that's absolutely mandatory. You need to get a set of aftermarket tracks. That is always a hill I will die on. But outside of that, the stock kit, even though the tooling is as old as it is, it still builds very well, or I should say the end results are one that are very, very good. It's a great kit. Uh, some people out there are going to scoff at that, specifically when they just went through the portion of the video where I had to make some tweaks and mods to the racks and all that other good stuff. Even with that considered, the end results are excellent. This is a very nicely detailed model, and it's one of those older tooling dragon kits that really did age quite well. Even though there are a lot of other more modern tooling kits out there that are better than this older kit over here, that doesn't mean that you can discount this one and write it off completely. This kit here, in my opinion, is still a viable option out there if you're looking for a, a nice M1A2 build. The only caveat is that if you're someone that doesn't really have those skill sets to build something like this, then I would strongly recommend just opting for an easier to build kit, like the examples from Tamiya come to mind. The Tamiya kit 
is probably specifically the A2 kits that came out in the early 2000s time frame. Detail-wise, are probably on par, if not similar, to this example over here, and they are a easier build in comparison. However, I think this kit here might still have an edge in some respects over even the newer tooling kits done by Tamiya. Having said that though, yes, the Tamiya kits are easier to put together compared to the old school Dragon one. But if you have the nerve for it and you have the skill sets for it, the Dragon kit here, as well as the other contemporaries that were released in the same lineup, of course, are something that you shouldn't overlook. And there's nothing much more needs to be said about that, which takes us directly to recommendations. So from the get-go, if you are a fan of the M1 Abrams family itself, or just a fan of modern era vehicles, or just modern era American vehicles, this kit here is definitely one that I recommend. Because this is a Dragon Kit, and a vintage Dragon Kit no less, this does make it somewhat collectible. Yes, there are some elitists out there that will poo-poo that idea, but believe it or not, there are people out there, myself included, that like to build and collect the vintage kits from various companies, and Dragon is one of them. And if that's you, well, welcome to the channel and you're in good company, but also, because Dragon released a series of vehicles based on this tooling, you could go ahead and acquire all of them and build them out to the various ways that they are represented in the kit's instructions. And because these kits are still relatively available and relatively affordable when found, this definitely makes collecting them much more of an easy venture compared to some of the other options I've brought on this table in the past. Also along similar lines, if you're a fan of just building and collecting variants of the M1 Abrams, again, this kit would fit very nicely in your collection as well. You're the type of guy that has an M1 kit from all the manufacturers, be it from Tamiya, Eshi, Ryfield. Well, obviously, the old school Dragon one, along with the new school Dragon ones, would definitely fit into that type of collection without there being any sort of issues. I said this is actually a really decent kit and it's one that in my opinion is a bit underrated but either way my collection is definitely more fulfilled and is one that feels a bit more complete now that I have this example added to its ranks. And yes, after my experience with this one over here, I have absolutely no reservations with going ahead and picking up the other M1 kits released by Dragon from the 1990s time frame all the way up to even until very recently. However, of course, those would all be topics for future videos for a future date. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale M1 A2 Abrams main battle tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here, or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop a new post of content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as photographs of the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again, I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. See you there.